evening, everybody. We've got a packed house tonight. It's nice to see people here. We are 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 Let's try this again. Good evening, evening, evening. Oh, wait. <laughs> anyway, it's nice to see everybody here tonight. We're going to um, start this meeting at 6.31 p.m. Monday, April 3rd. The meeting is called to order. Um, I welcome all of you tonight for the council meeting in which we conduct the business of the city. I want to remind everyone that for the city's rules of decorum, all speakers, members of the audience, and council members are to conduct themselves with decorum and not to engage in conduct that interrupts the orderly conduct of the meeting. And if you are choose to be a speaker, if you would please direct it to the council on the dais, not the audience, it would be appreciated because that's how it's supposed to work. I want to also recognize uh, Robin Carter, a uh, previous council member for I won't name how many years. Uh, and Mayor John Campbell is here also. Uh, tonight we're very pleased to have, once again, one of our proud veterans, uh, John Chauvin, if you can come up, John, please, uh, Marine Sergeant, to conduct the Pledge of Allegiance for us tonight. And also, uh, Mr. Chauvin, I think that, um, let's see, how many years were you a teacher, Mr. Chauvin? 35. And I think all three of my children, which are now, I won't say I'm <laughs> Great. Now the children's show, but anyway, his actually Mr. Chauvin and Mrs. Chauvin were my kids' teachers, so a uh, wonderful asset to our meeting. The show is yours. The show is mine. Okay, I am, as aforementioned, John Chauvin, Sergeant, United States Marine Corps, 1963 to 1967. I served in Vietnam. It is an honor to be able to lead the City Council, the Burns City Council, in the Pledge of Allegiance. When the pledge, oh, please stay seated. <laughs> <laughs> when I call attention, if you those who are able to, if you will please stand up, gentlemen, if you'll remove your covers, and when I say present arms, all those who are active military or reserve those who are veterans and those who are law enforcement and first responders, hand salute. All others, place your hand over your heart. That is when I say present arms, then we'll do the salute. Okay, attention. Facing the flag. Present arms. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Order arms. You may be seated. Thank you, Mr. Chauvin, <laughs> Commander Ramirez. And thank you again, uh, Council Member uh, Metro Cash Abangita, Cash for short, uh, for uh, putting this up. It's very important that we celebrate our military in Laverne as we are a military neighborhood. And uh, thank you for bringing this up. Thank you to the Band of Brothers, 12034, for being here very much. We have uh, three presentations tonight. I'm going to mix up the order a little bit. What? Oh, getting too excited. Roll call, please, Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, Council Member Kessler-Pavita. Here. Council Member Johnson. Here. Council Member Lau. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Crosby. Here. Mayor Hepler. Here. All members present. Okay, now we'll go to presentations. I'm going to mix it up a little bit. Uh, we're going to do, uh, we have uh, three presentations tonight. We have the South Coast Air Quality Management District. Second, and then also the uh, proclamation declaring the month of April as Arab American Heritage Month. And last presentation of the proclamation, uh, actually that's second, declaring the month of April as Arts, Culture, and Creativity Month. With that, <laughs> sir, I'm not now you just step forward. City of Laverne, whereas for over a century, Arab Americans have made valuable contributions to several aspects of American society, 
including medicine, law, business, education, technology, government, military service, and culture. And whereas Arab Americans share in the entrepreneurial spirit and bring a diverse set of ethnic values derived from their rich culture and tradition, traditions. And whereas Arab Americans join all Americans in the desire to see a peaceful and diverse society where every individual is treated equally and feels safe. And whereas the incredible contributions and heritage of Arab Americans have helped build a better nation. And whereas during Arab American Heritage Month is an opportunity to increase awareness about key issues and priorities within the Arab American community and between all cultures in American society. Now be it proclaimed by the city of Laverne that the month of April 2023 be recognized as Arab American Heritage Month. And we encourage all residents to celebrate the accomplishments of Arab Americans in our community and nation. Thank you to the City Council for the proclamation for Arab American Heritage Month in April. I grew up in Laverne. I went to Damien High School. I then went to UC Santa Barbara, and Laverne brought me back where I was uh, blessed to get hired by the Laverne Police Department uh, by Chief Ron Ingalls. Uh, six years after that, my career took me to the LA County DA's office where I'm currently a lieutenant. I also met my wife, uh, Rain, who was sitting in the crowd in Laverne. <laughs> and I met her at the local Baskin Robbins. <laughs> Let, let's say I ate a lot of ice. <laughs> My wife also grew up in Laverne and attended Benita High School and the University of Laverne. <coughs> My kids, Eva, Eli, and David, and my nephew, Michael, keep us busy. And my mom, thank God for her, helps us every day. We love the community of Laverne. And thanks to our amazing police department and fire department, it's a safe place to raise a family. And special thanks to veterans and all the senior volunteers in the city. As you already mentioned, Arab Americans have contributed in many ways, and I am honored to accept this certificate on behalf of Arab, the Arab American community and blessed to be a member of the Deliver community. Come on. There you go. Yep. All right. Just up a little circle. There you go. One, two, three. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're going to go celebrate at Baskin Robbins. <laughs> are from Inland Valley Repertory Theater and Inland Valley Repertory Theater. They're twins. They're twins. <laughs> Welcome tonight. City of Laverne Proclamation. Whereas the 2023 Culture and Creativity Month is the fifth annual statewide celebration first established by the California Legislature in 2019, and whereas the arts not only an impressive and important agent for economic development, but also impact various social for societal issues, and whereas arts, culture, and creativity spark innovation, growth, and positive change through the sharing of stories and resources, and whereas the creative community always finds ways to lift us up during our most difficult times, spark individual creativity, foster empathy and understanding, spur civic engagement, and serve as a continual source of personal enrichment, inspiration, and growth. And whereas the City of Laverne celebrates arts, culture, and creativity, through organized city events, including the annual Sip of Laverne Wine Walk, Spring Fling Vendor Fair, and numerous youth events that foster creativity, including the Sidewalk Coloring Contest, which is coming. Okay. Now be it proclaimed to the City of Laverne that the month of April 2023 be recognized as Arts, Culture, and Creativity Month. 
and we encourage all residents to recognize and join the celebration by attending local arts, culture, and creativity events. Thank you both. Thank you, Mayor Heffern and City Council members. Um, I'm Donna Marie Minato, and this is Bridget Healy. And my husband Frank and I are 22-year residents of the City of Laverne. Um, my husband received his MBA at University of Laverne, and our daughter graduated class of 2019 from Benita High School. We are the co-founders of the Inland Valley Repertory Theater Company located here in Claremont. As president of our board of trustees, Bridget helps to ensure that our nonprofit arts organization's quarter million dollar annual budget is used to sustain our mission of providing high quality theatrical productions to the community and by fostering the talents of artists of all ages. Since 1990, when my husband and I co-founded Inland Valley Repertory Theater, or as we know it as IVRT. IVRT entertains, enriches our community with plays and musicals, educates hundreds of children each year through our outreach programs, and provides employment to actors, musicians, designers, and technicians. We are proud to be a part of the Laverne's vibrant and uh, vital arts community, and beyond that, of Los Angeles County, uh, where we re have received funding from the Board of Supervisors and from the State of California. Shout out to Marco from Senator Portentino's office over there on Zoom. Um, thank you so much. Mayor Hepburn and city council members for this wonderful support of the arts as evidenced by tonight's very important proclamation. And now with your permission, I'm a brand new Aztecs fan. <laughs> I wonder why. Yeah. Thank you so much. presentation from uh, South Coast AQMD uh, are, uh, will be presented by Michael Cacciotti, the SCA QMD Governing Board Vice Chair. And Mr. Cacciotti, are you not mayor of South Pasadena? Just transferred over as mayor now, uh, five-time mayor, now council member. Five-time, that means... We rotate. That's a lot of years, Mr. Cacciotti. <laughs> it's We're always done. a pleasure. Mr. Cacciotti and I are on many different boards, and uh, he's uh, got some great items for us to view tonight, especially for uh, electric vehicles, electric lawnmowers, battery power, excuse me, battery power. Take it away, Mr. Cacciotti. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem Council members, great to see every good night staff. Residents, we've got a lot of incentives for you tonight I want to go over, but I'll give you some background in case you're not pretty much aware of what the South Coast Air Quality Management District does. So right there, I'm your representative. There's 13 members on the board. I represent the 34 cities of Eastern LA County. Representatives from all four counties, but I represent those 34 cities from Claremont, Laverne, South Pass, Pasadena, Monterey Park, all the way to Santa Clarita. Two million people. Next. Is somebody doing? Oh, there, perfect. Thanks. So the EQMD, kind of middle, that little square, is four <coughs> counties LA, San Bernardino, Orange, and Riverside County, 17 million people. We've got 28,000 permits we issue. I'll go over those in a moment. Environmental justice communities, and you can look, one third of our US containerized cargo traffic, ocean going vessels, trucks, warehouses, come by our communities every day. On the left, we were formed in the 70s after EPA and the Federal Air Quality Standards set standards because we were out of compliance, so that's where we were formed. Next. So, air pollution, we break it into two, two different parts. Stationary sources, though, don't really move, those are cleaner solvents that paints to use sometimes. Auto body paint shops, gas stations, power plants, refineries, landfills. On the right are the mobile sources, which unfortunately we don't control. Federal government does, and some of the California Air Resources Board. But those are the big ones. The ocean going vessels, the airplanes, trains, the Metrolink trains that go by, the passenger trains, even freight trains, and a lot of off-road equipment, tractors and lawn equipment. For the first time in 2021, lawn equipment, stuff you cut your grass with, weed whackers, edge trimmers, surpass cars and light duty trucks as a source of pollution because there's no catalytic converters on it in California. Mm -hmm. Next. So these two sources of pollution are bad because we don't need attainment and we'll find out why it's bad later. But on the left, that's the smog we see. It's gonna start in a couple months. You see here at the foothills, 
if you're lucky to see the hills sometimes. So it's nitric oxide mixes with volatile organic compounds. Photochemical reaction creates smog. And it's different chemical, re we're doing a chemistry experiment, different parts of nitrogen oxide, volatile organic compounds, creates a smog in the right. This stuff is really dangerous, particularly matter because it's so small. That little gray stick is your human hair. That little, at the bottom right, that little blue gold, uh, gold, uh, globe is particulate matter 10. When you came in here, and I should do this demonstration of the high schools when I go, have a little meter. As the kids come in, we came in, you just kicked up dust. You don't see it, but we can monitor it and you inhale it. You don't only really inhale it, your body kicks it out. That's PM10. Go a little higher, that red globe in the blue, that's PM2.5. Unfortunately, that's by cars, trucks, autos, you know, uh, mechanized equipment. That goes into your blood-brain barrier and goes through your circulatory system. What's even more dangerous, even higher, that little red globe right there, that's ultrafine at the very top, that's even smaller, microscopic. And unfortunately, again, it lodges in your organs for years. We do studies at Cedar sinai and it, it kind of sits there 10, 15, 20 years. We usually expose rats to that and see the difference in their cells. It goes into your cells, even smaller than your cells, and changes things, expresses genes that are consistent with Alzheimer's. In, in older adults. So there was a first test done three months ago at University of British Columbia. They exposed 27 humans. They volunteered for the study to this particulate matter. MRI before they went in, MRI after. They found a, a reduction in cognitive function just after one hour exposure. You can read the study. Next. Here's why we're so passionate about it. That's your body, your family's body, your kid's body, the kids out there. I coach playing soccer all the time. Uh, Tim coached for many years in soccer. When you inhale this stuff, it just doesn't go in. It goes throughout your entire body, your circulatory system, in your heart, in your lungs, and now we know in your brain and your nervous system, and it causes havoc, premature deaths, etc. So you've got pets, you've got animals, you've got wildlife, they've got a respiratory system too, so it impacts them. All of your health by anything that comes out of your tailpipes, your lawn equipment, your cars. Next. Here's what's bad. If we can really try to meet clean air standards, get rid of a lot of this stuff by electrifying things, hydrogen fuel cell reducing pollution, we reduce 1,500 deaths a year on the right, left. Secondly, we reduce hospitalizations or prevent them. And this third one, I don't know about Tim, all the years you coach, I, like Tim coached many years, over 30 I've coached, AYSO, high school, college. I've never had more than one kid on a team, it's usually every three or four years with asthma. Last year, three kids on my team with asthma and nebulizers at every practice, and you gotta, Tim, you gotta watch them in the game, hey, you practice, Chris, sit down for a minute, you're over, I, don't you have, you got, I don't want you going to the hospital. So it's really serious, there's 100,000 asthmatics in, in LA County. On the right, if we improve air quality, we'll save the healthcare system over billions of dollars. Next. So there's good news on the left, that's ozone, it's been going down, but it's kind of leveling off. We need to get a little lower to meet federal standards. On the right, that purple at the top in 2012, that's bad because cancer-causing toxins are heavy. But in, in, in uh, intervening years, we've reduced it significantly with technology and stuff, so getting better next. Uh, and this is, again, the challenges. We don't control it. We do station resources, AQMD, but the federal government's not doing their job. With the trucks out there, off-road equipment, ships, trains, again, passenger and freight. Next. Just a quick thing, there's three agencies that regulate air quality in the left square is EPA, federal government, center is the California Air Resources Board in Sacramento, and right is us. If you don't meet, here's the one thing, if we don't meet clean air standards soon, there's a couple years at the bottom, 2023, it's the year 2031, here's what the federal government could do, and they threaten us. They could, everybody needs a permit, gas stations, oil refineries, etc. they could double their fees. In the middle, Federal Highway Administration could take away all our money, and on the right, and they've almost done this, there was a draft plan. On Mondays, only even number of cars on the highway. Tuesday, only odd number of cars. So there's serious uh, repercussions next. Good news. This is for all your residents, council members, staff. There's money available. On the left, $1,500 off. You want to upgrade your furnace, clean your furnace, $1,500 off. It doesn't matter what you make. Second column, turn in your gas power lawnmower. You have to get spark plugs, gas oil anymore. I did it 20 years ago. $250 off your lawnmower by getting state-of-the-art all-electric lawnmower, battery-powered, no more cords, state-of-the-art, they're great. Almost basically comparable to uh, gas equipment. Third column, get an electric car, we'll give you $250 for your charging station. If you don't make as much money, income's a little lower, we'll give you $500. Finally, 
you got an old car polluting, you've just been sitting there, you want to get rid of it, turn it in, get a cleaner gas car, an electric car, a plug-in hybrid, a hydrogen fuel cell, depending on your income, we'll give you up to $9,500 off. Or, we've had several people do it in the last two months, they wanted e-bikes. You've got an event coming up, Tim, I think, April 23rd, with the Heart of the Valley or something, bikes. Uh, yeah, yes, it's Heart of the Foothills. Heart of the Foothills, sorry. So, do that, and you just, it's successful, so some people want like transit passes forever. There's a lot of money available for residents to help you clean up the air in our, our basin. At the bottom, we're coming out with a program, a little long line there, that says, development of a zero emission appliances and space heating. So, if you have any ideas for us, let us know what you think about, that we should be giving you money to turn away from natural gas. Next. So, for cities, commercial, commercial businesses in your community, and I know, Tim, I was looking right here before I came in. It just came out. We're going to go send it out Saturday night. You've got a Laverne power equipment. So we've got a program at this okay, let's go state level right now. They have a program where you get up to 75% off. Mom and Pop Gardeners out there. Just turn it. That's when you have turning your old gas equipment. By new, it will give you, the state will give you 75% off state-of-the-art electric equipment. And most of it's 95 100% comparable to gas. We were doing a study today out at LA Unified School District. We have three different, exact same size, uh, 200 by 200 feet, almost an acre. And we gave three weed whackers, two with gas and one with battery to see who would win. Batteries never won, usually far behind. Today's the first time battery crushed the, the gas producing yes. equipment. So, and I was a little late, didn't get a chance to shave. I apologize for that because we're at my yard, a tree fell. We did, a, we did a video of cutting a tree and we had an electric saw we wanted to see because people said it doesn't work. 17 inch dam diameter within 17 seconds, shoo, right through it like butter. Set electric, uh, 14 inch, 20 inch electric chainsaw. So the, now this program, we have an HMD separate from the state, will give you 85% off. And this is for cities, school districts, Glendale's taking advantage, Pasadena's taking advantage, Alhambra. We took advantage of it in South Pasadena. We're building quarters. We want to get something out this side. Tim is thinking about it in Pomona. We'd love to have something here. We will have staff come out to you, try the equipment for free for two or three weeks, stay in the art riding lawnmowers, 60 inch, that costs $20,000. If you like it, it's as good as the, the gas, it's gonna cost you $5,000. No more gas, no more oil, no more spark plugs, cleaner smelling people, protecting the youth, the kids that play soccer in your community. So we're excited. Ben's gonna show you a demonstration Anybody wants to stand next to me with long hair, Wendy? <laughs> Council member? Robin Carter? I just make you some suggestions. You were welcome to come down. You've got a lot longer than me. I've seen Michael do this before, and it just like blows everything off the table. Hold <laughs> <laughs> your stuff. Yeah. So, Ben, go ahead. <laughs> this is typical of the equipment that, that we have now. Before, five, ten years ago, we wouldn't do this. I like being tractor for this. Michael, I'm not going to lie. My grandson loves that. Really? Yeah, three years old. It's like the more you blow, the just like... <laughs> <laughs> I should have invited him. I'm sorry, Joe. No, we should have said that, but he loves it. Good. So we have, there's a lot of money available again for cities and stuff. The bottom is our, our shuttle van. Uh, at the state level, there's, we administer a lot of programs from the state card. Right now, programs uh, about another two months is every source of work, car and water, there's $51 million. If you got public work trucks as you go through your next budget, some old trucks you want to get rid of some diesel. There's electric, there's plug-in hybrid, there's, there's fuel cell, there's, there's natural gas. You can get like 50, 70% off. We got, I think, $70,000 off for that shuttle through a state program, and we administer those programs. Heavy-duty trucks, you may have some businesses here. There's a lot of money. We, unfortunately, two years ago, I fought for us, but I didn't get the votes. We gave $50 million away in the Empire to convert to diesel trucks, charging stations, infrastructure. There's money available now for LA County. If you've got businesses that you know that want that money, apply for the money. We'll help, help them get it for the trucks. Next. So, Vern, you've, you've taken advantage of a lot of money in the last several years, $233,000 for different types of equipment, etc. In the middle, Mobile Source Air Pollution Reduction Committee. When every one of you registers your car, $4 of that money goes into three funds. The city gets of that $4, every single year you register a car, you get 40% in. 40% and it just keeps building up until you use it. It can only be used for reducing mobile source pollution. You've got to get electric cars, hydrogen fuel cars, trucks, 
You can put in more CNG infrastructure, charging stations, heavy duty, level two, level threes. Can be, but you gotta reduce mobile source pollution, give people transit passes, staff transit passes. So the middle one, 30% of that goes to that committee and they just give money away every year. $15 million in his basin, so you can apply for that. At the bottom, that's your money. You had, I think, a balance of a half, half a million dollars, 20, you've used a lot, 2021. You still got a lot of money in there, so you can use it any of the carpools, tra public transit, use that money. It's sitting there, please use it to reduce pollution and save on your budget. Um, next. On the left, if you, any of your small business and your citizens will have staff come out there and help them, whether it's a gas station, it can be, you know, no, no oil refineries here. We, um, it does, so it could be a factory, a small factory, a warehouse, has some issues with some of our rules, we'll send staff to the system. At the bottom, if there's a complaint, you smell an odor, let us know. We'll come out, we want to keep them in business, but there are some toxic chemicals. The stuff you sterilize medical equipment with, we regulate that, but we didn't realize how serious the sterilization ethylene oxide was until we put our monitors out there and talked to the scientists causes brain damage, so several, one in Ontario, uh, and two in Los Angeles County, we've had to shut one down and work with them to improve, because it's dangerous to the residents. When I was in um, San Fernando four weeks ago, the council member brought up, Mike, there's a, uh, all American asphalt at the border of our city, the our city, we smell at the parks, there's odor, there's dust, we sent five staff out there the next day, they were closed, they went the following day, everything was okay that day, they were watering stuff down that day, I think they knew we were out, but we issued some uh, notices of violation because it weren't keeping records. And then we went to the schools and the parks and said, here's information, call us, we'll send our staff out, we want to keep them open, but if they're not following, we want to protect you. So we're ha happy to do that, I'll even come out too. Um, the second one, there's a free mobile app when I come in today to my cities. Today I took the Gold Line, Tim, you'll be happy. And then I, Robin, be happy too. And then I got on the uh, 188 Foothill Transit. This one didn't break down like it did last week on my way to uh, industry. Thank God for pen picking me up. But I can check your air quality. Tim, your air quality today is, let's see. A green is very good, 44, which means you're under 50, so great air quality in the city of Laverne. What's Laverne? Come on. Okay. <laughs> so get to that. On the third column, we've got air monitors throughout the four counties. And we monitor for your health, and we also monitor for Department of Defense and other departments in case there's an attack. We monitor those every day. Right side, Actually, you can go to the store and buy air quality sensors to see what your air quality is at your neighborhood and stuff. We have an air quality sensor performance evaluation center where you can bring it in and we'll tell you if it's working, if it's good enough. Next. Finally, if you need help, you can call me directly, send me an email, be happy to come out and work with you on any issues you may have or need support on. And I've got Rainbow, you get her emails all the time. Ben Wong's one of my consultants. Tim Sandoval also helps out. He's got a council meeting tonight so he couldn't come. But questions, Mr. Mayor, whatever I can do to support, let me know. Michael, as usual, thank you. Uh, Council, any questions for Michael? Answer all the things. We have a new public works director, and she will be uh, getting all the information, and hopefully we can start utilizing some of this stuff to make it a cleaner environment for our city. Let her know her number. We'll be happy to contact your person. Thank you. And Michael, just so everybody knows, Michael uses his a powered bike, not, not a powered bike, but a man-powered or a female-powered bike, and he rides everywhere, takes the buses, as he said, and we have a lot of meetings with the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments and being uh, the previous mayor and council member, but he goes to every single community on his bike and rapid transit to get where he needs to go. So um, kudos to you. You're a testament to AQMD, and I really appreciate it. And also Rainbow. Rainbow's at most of the meetings uh, that we go to for all the committees, and uh, we just need to jump on and get this money, don't we? Yep, sitting there. Thank you, Michael. Again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. break and let people that for the presentation uh, that we're here they can leave if they like to so we'll take a three-minute break Mr. Domer I was going to say I would like to uh, bring up the announcements our new board of directors is that is your self off I know they like money. Thank you, Mike. So I'd like to introduce May as our new public works director. We can't hear. Mike on. I think is it on? Okay. Yeah, you need to get closer. 
So Meg McWade is our new Public Works Director for the City of Laverne. Meg, do you want to say a few things? I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity. I bring roughly over 30 years. I like to say that I'm seasoned. But I bring a lot of experience, and I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. I excellent love the Eggsland Adventure. Boy, was that fun. We had our candy, we had stickers for the kitties, and a lot of goodwill and fun times, and we cleared about a hundred bucks. So what can I say? One jar of jelly at a time, right? We're, we're doing it. Okay, so the Laverne Historical Society is at it again. This Saturday, we are going to go visit Upland's Cooper Regional History Museum. So I can go check it out and take pictures of the exhibits and think about maybe how we might exhibit some of our artifacts someday with the Laverne Historical Society. This is a free event. Pick up a flyer. You can either meet us there or if you want a carpool, you can contact me and we can make those arrangements to carpool. But it's our neighbor right around the corner in Upland. So we should find out what's happening in neighboring cities. That's this Saturday. Now, on the 6th of May, we are going to tour the opulent and amazing Nethercut Museum collection in Silmar. I understand this is a uh, not-to-be-believed collection that was gathered together by the person who was the heir to the Merle Norman cosmetics fortune. And it sounds like he spent money like a drunken sailor. <laughs> and he has a collection of antique cars that would rival Jay Leno's. And if antique cars are not your thing, there's musical instruments and articulated uh, toys, I think, and I, everything. Whatever struck his fancy, he collected. Two buildings worth. So we are going to pick up the bus in front of my house. This is a uh, bus that comes to us from Supervisor Catherine Barger. We need to fill the bus, so 55 people we have room for, and they will take us out to the Nethercut. It is a cost of $30, which includes a special docent-led tour of the Nethercut, and you will then bring your own lunch, and it's a modest fundraiser for the Historical Society. So come support us and have a really fun day and see a lot of cool stuff, and you don't have to drive. So that's a real bonus as well. We will be at the San Gabriel Valley Heart of the Foothills event on the 23rd. We will be at the, what's coming up on the 29th? I can't yard keep sale. track of it all. Yard sale. Yes, the yard sale. And sip of Laverne. Yes, well, come by items from the Laverne Historical Society. This is another fundraiser for us. Help us get that truck over the line so we can see it at the 4th of July parade. So thank you all so much for your support of the Historical Society. I'll put the flyers out on the table. How did you guys do with the uh, Bonita uh, car show? Oh, wow, with the Bonita car show, the person who won the 50-50 raffle donated the proceeds to us. That's great. <laughs> So we we made almost uh, nine hundred dollars at the car show. Is that enough for radiator? <laughs> it is almost enough for the new radiator. We are getting that yes. piece by piece. So if anybody has yes. to change tonight, <laughs> need a or radiator. Join, and what are the fees to join a, a lifetime membership? Two hundred dollars. And what is it just for a yearly membership? Twenty dollars. Per person, is that correct? Per person, or twenty-five for a family membership. Excellent. We're keeping it cheap. Excellent, excellent expenditure of okay. money. It's a very good cost. That's right, and I've got one jar of jelly still <coughs> waiting to be sold tonight. I don't so. think it'll be here when you come in. Come in, <laughs> Bob. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sherry. Anybody else for announcements? Good evening. My
My name is Don Kendrick, uh, 2383rd Street in Laverne. First of all, I would like to thank whoever's responsible for the VFW Lead the Flag Salute as a proud veteran. That would be Mesh and Gita. Um, it Council means a lot. So thank you very much. I'm here this evening to announce a new Facebook page that has been set up called Laverne Best. The Laverne Best Facebook page is dedicated to sharing with our residents the uncommon good within our community. The idea is to share these ideas through social media. So how does it work? When these caring, caring and generous acts of kindness occur, and you are either part of it or an observer, it is hoped that you will write up a short description and submit it with any photos via email to LavernBestStory at gmail.com. Again, LavernBestStory at gmail.com or via direct message on Facebook. The submissions will be reviewed to ensure they follow the guidelines and then posted so our community that is comprised of Laverne residents, business owners, organizations, and employees can celebrate the kindness within our city. All aspects, all aspects of life in Laverne will be included. Schools, PTAs, sports organizations, churches, veterans and foreign wars post 12034, which we saw tonight. <coughs> Retired senior volunteer patrol, which are all over the city doing great things. All city departments and employees, mobile home parks, Hillcrest, Haynes Family uh, Services, including David Margaret Home, clubs, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, Chamber of Commerce, Historical Society, who we just heard from, lots of good things going there, Sowing Seeds for Life, which was posted today about all the goodness that they do in this community, Youth and Family Action, and others. Many vigilant citizens will be constantly on the alert, kind of a watchdog thing, including hopefully all of you, to spread the goodness of our city. So please go to Learn Best on Facebook and sign up. Some of the criteria includes always keep it positive, acts of kindness and caring, no politics, no promotional or spam, keep it clean, and maintain mutual respect. So if you get caught doing an act of kindness that someone is a witness to, and you think nothing of it, and it gets posted on Laverne Best, congratulations and thank you for helping make our city the best it can be. It can be. Or, said slightly differently, Laverne Best. Okay, Grim. I have... What's here? Where's that baby? Gimme, gimme, gimme. Excuse me. <laughs> I have a number of flyers um, on this that I'll set on the table. You're welcome to pick one up. They have QR codes, so it makes it real easy for you to um, to get on. We'd love each and every one of you to not only get on, but be a participant and look for all the kindness and the goodness in our city. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to announce anything? Do we have anybody on? Council members, any announcements? Um, just a couple. I think we probably we'll probably do it again. Oh. Mr. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, great to see you all today. <clears throat> just wanted to remind everybody about the Cassie meeting uh, this Wednesday at 5 p.m. at Hillcrest in the Citrus Meeting Room. Uh, we have a great update coming, and I look forward to seeing everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Allison. That's what we're done. And just a couple, just a couple of announcements. Um, if anyone is free and available on Wednesday, April fifth, um, there is going to be a blood drive for the Laverne community held at the Veterans Hall from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, appointments are um, preferred, but walk-ins are welcome. Um, and if you give blood on Wednesday, you get a free LA County Fair ticket and a Red Cross t-shirt. Um, if you're not motivated by that, I hope you're motivated by hopefully giving back um, by donating your blood. 
Um, the other couple things I wanted to announce, April 8th, which is this Saturday, um, there is an LA County Fair job fair. Um, so they're looking for folks to work the LA County Fair. So perhaps if you've got individuals in your family, if you're interested in some work for the fair season, there is a um, job fair from 8.30 to 2 p.m. at the Fairplex. Um, the job fair entrance is going to be at gate 9 on white. And then from April 14th through the 15th, there is a West Coast Historical Military Collector Show. And so I wanted to highlight this one because um, active military and their families do receive free admission. Um, and it's showcasing a huge assortment of historical military antiques, collectibles from all time periods and countries. And the Fairplex does hold other events, but those were the two that I just wanted to highlight um, for anyone who might be interested. Thank you, Councilman Bernal. Um, also, um, just a couple items that are that are going to be happening here very quickly. Uh, Wednesday, April 5th, 9, 9 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. Sidewalk Coloring Contest at Monero Square. And we'll be posting that on our website, the city website, but uh, that's a hot date. And then Saturday, April 8th at 10 a.m., we have our cool car show downtown Laverne at 10 a.m. And also at ULB uh, from 12.30 p.m. to 2 o'clock p.m. on Thursday, April 6th this week, ULB Mental Health and Wellbeing Program Tour. We'll post those on our city website. Mr. Gomer, is that correct? Um, and that should be open. Anybody else? We will close public announcements. We will move to um, consent calendar. Um, as a reminder, the consent calendar is considered routine matters and will be enacted by one motion unless pulled for separate discussion. Mr. Domer, were some items pulled for uh, on this consent calendar? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, items number three and item number four were pulled by a resident. And we can remove those, but we can vote on the remainder of the uh, consent calendar, correct? Uh, Tim? Yes. Um, I will not be voting on three because I'm a member of the Church of the Brethren. Okay, then you refresh yourself. Okay. <laughs> With that, we have a motion for the remainder of the items. I motion to approve the consent calendar, the remaining items, um, all except number three and number four. Do have a second? Second. Vote, please. And I carry five vote. Thank you very much. We have another one. Yes. Mr. Delmer. Mr. Delmer, who, uh, who is the person that uh, pulled these items? That was just uh, this was pulled, pulled by Vanita Boat. Ms. Bochamp. Ms. Bochamp, you have the mic. <coughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. The reason I had this pulled was for the exact reason that Mr. Johnson left the room. I feel that there is a conflict of interest. According to the National Conference of State Legislatures, it explains that no public official at any level of state or local government shall make, participate in making, or in any way attempt to use his official position to influence a governmental decision in which he or she knows has reason or knows that he has a financial interest. That is quoted from the Government Code 87100. Even if it doesn't fall within the legality of the definition of conflict of interest, I believe that the church members and attenders who are council members may have personal biases towards the church that could influence their decision-making process. They may feel a sense of loyalty or obligation to the church that could cloud their judgment and lead to decisions that are not in the best interest of the community. The church may also have financial ties to the council members through donations, such as the elections that just recently took place, and or other means which could create a conflict of interest financially. The financial relationship could potentially influence the council member's decision-making process, as they may be more inclined to vote in favor of the church to maintain these financial ties. Even if there is no actual conflict of interest, the perception of bias can be damaging to the council's reputation and the public's trust in the government or a lack thereof. 
If it appears that the council member is favoring the church over other community members or organizations, it could create distrust and undermine the legitimacy of the council's decision. Finally, <clears throat> as it is explained in our <clears throat> Constitution, there is a separation of church and state. The Constitution of the United States establishes a, a separation of church and state which means the government officials should not be influenced by their religious beliefs or affiliations when making these decisions. If a city council member's religious beliefs or affiliation are influencing their decisions, it could be seen as a violation of the First Amendment and lead to legal challenges and or future litigation consequences. I know that Mr. Hepburn was a previous attender or member of the church. I don't know if other council members are or not, and so I feel that at, at even if you are not currently there, at some point you did have an affiliation with the church and should also recuse yourself. That's what I'm going to ask the attorney, right? May I stop okay. you? Can I stop you one second? No, because you cut it into my three minutes. Well, I'm, I not did... gonna, I'm not going to cut it into three This is a very good question because I have not been an active well, member for Mr. Over... Domer explained it to me in an email, but I still feel like this is something that should be explained in more detail, and I think that the city attorney would be best to handle this. Well, if I can just finish my... I was an active member when the children were young, but I have not been an active member for more than 15 years. I was on the, um, the Hillcrest, not Hillcrest, but the um, Church of the Brethren Board of Directors, but that was also four or five years ago. Um, I know there's some affiliation there, so I just want to make sure that, as Ms. Bochamp stated, I, I didn't really think about it because it's been so long since I've been a member or an active member. So, um, I... There you go. Uh, given that you are not currently a board of, uh, director's member uh, and not active in the church, uh, and also that um, it's not a source of income to you, it is not a conflict of interest. It is your decision to determine whether you have a bias that would prevent you from acting fairly and in the city's best interest in this uh, situation. Uh, in the absence of evidence of such a bias, you certainly may part. Thank you. That's the end of my comment. But I do want to thank Mr. Domer for getting back to me through email and giving me a more detailed explanation as it, but I still felt like my comments were necessary for the public to hear. I appreciate that. Thank, thank you, you Ms. Bochamp. Item number four. Oh, so I'm sorry. One at a time. Mr. Bowman. If you close public comment, we're going to close public comment on item number three. Unless someone else wants to speak on item number three, I would like to please. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Um, I just have a couple of questions about this. Um, there seems to be a lot of detail in the package you have. I didn't print the whole thing out. How many spaces are we actually talking about? Additional? Yeah. You're giving away the you know, there'll be a training total, money. There'll be a total of 50 spaces. Uh, previously, we had 32. We're adding 18 into it uh, with this license agreement. Okay. And how much is this worth? There's no monetary value on this. Um, seems to me, I looked at it, and they talked about repaving it for, in today's dollars, 95000 I'm doing it off memory, so I'm not sure. But there must be a dollar value attached to all this. It would be interesting yeah, to the, let everybody uh, know. Last couple sentences of the discussion right about the fiscal analysis, it talks about that uh, the value of the 50 stalls is about 6333 a year, or $127 per stall. That $95,000 also includes the pavement and redoing of the public alley. Um, so actually, the amount of money invested in the uh, property itself is less than that. So, but uh, we estimate it's about 127 per stall per year. Out of curiosity, when might the payment? Because we know that when you make an estimate, it it rarely uh, ends up being that, and it's never under. Well, we, we, are there provisions yeah. for overages? Uh, well, again, it's an estimate, and we're going to redo it because that's the value of it, and it's also for the public alley. We're going to be redoing the parking lot this summer time frame when we do our normal uh, pavement so we can roll it into a larger project and get some efficiencies there. And you received a bid already? We have not received a bid. Again, that's an estimate. So the 95000 is a guess? Is an estimate. And you're going to vote on this without knowing? 
It'll come back to us if there's any egregious changes. Is that correct, Mr. Doman? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the contract will come to you. So, yeah. What would egregious, out of curiosity, mean if the bid came in at 120000 um, Again, I know that there's monies in our accounts for our CAP and for the alley, as he's saying, so we're looking at the estimate to be uh, uh, quality of, of having the contractor um, who's doing that included in his work. So, yeah. And again, it's going to be part of a larger project, so there's going to be some efficiencies, so it's going to be with other street projects. But if we found some undiscovered issues with, uh, we talk about, you know, repairing the tree wells and the car stops, which are pretty inexpensive, but if there was something major in that, yes, we would bring it to the city council. And would the public know what the bid is? Will that be public knowledge? Typically those are, yes. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bowen. Ms. Kalusa. Kathy Kalusek, 2242 Third Street. As a long-term resident of downtown Laverne and um, having family that had businesses in downtown Laverne, it's much needed parking. We need all that we can get. So I think it's a great idea. And thanks, you guys, for working on it. Thank you very much. Any other comments on item three? We're going to go ahead and close public comment. Back to the desk. Do I have a motion? I move to approve consent item number three, Brethren Parking License Agreements. Second. I'll second. Vote, please. That was approved for like four, nothing? For seven. We'll wait for Mr. Johnson to return. So may not have an agenda in front of them. Item number four in the consent calendar is regarding the housing element report that is supposed to be submitted to the state of California. When elected officials do not provide corrected data to the public before voting upon it, it, be, it can be considered a breach of public trust and can lead to a lack of transparency and accountability in government decision making. <clears throat> At the housing element, both the study session and the meeting where you voted to approve Mrs. Gabaldon and I both pointed out numerous erroneous data that was in that presentation, and at no time was it ever corrected and represented to the public, yet the City Council voted to approve it anyway. This material still has not been corrected and provided to the public, and yet it's going to be submitted to the State of California. It is the responsibility of elected officials to ensure that they have access to accurate and reliable information when making decisions that affect the public. If corrected data becomes available after the initial information has been presented, it is incumbent upon officials to provide that information to the public in a timely and transparent manner so that the public can make informed decisions and hold <clears throat> officials accountable for their actions. Failing to do so can erode the trust in the democratic process and lead to a perception that the elected officials are not working in the best interest of the public. It can also result in policy decisions that are based on flawed or incomplete data, which can have serious consequences for the public. Therefore, it is crucial that elected officials prioritize transparency and accuracy in their decision-making processes, and that they take the necessary steps to ensure that corrected data is provided to the public before important decisions are made. I request that you please have that erroneous data corrected, represented, and then submitted to the state of California. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bochamp. Anyone else wish to speak on item four? Ms. Gabaldon. Cynthia Gabaldon, 25299 Amherst. 
Just to um, add for a few things is that it was very interesting reading the staff package because there was two sentences that were throughout it. Currently being implemented and in progress. Zero detail in all of that backup with anything that's really going on here in town concerning the actual implementation of the housing element or whatever is being planned. Um, secondly, um, a third of the tables, the way that they printed the PDF, you couldn't even make heads or tails of, of how anything worked out. This is just common courtesy to you there, and but also to us who are trying to figure out what's going on with everything. We had one table over four pages, we had one table over three pages, and there's just little things like that, especially for public members who might not understand what's supposed to be in those tables. There's no way to make heads or tails of what's actually been presented. <clears throat> Lastly, and I'm going to ask again, we need to have a workshop soon. We need to have a workshop before the zoning element starts getting pulled forward so that the people in the city of Laverne can really have a handle and understand what is going on with this housing element. No one has ever, ever come back about the arena numbers and about the true numbers on that. There is lawsuits going through the state of California at this time. There, the arena numbers are absolutely flawed. We need to pause and re-look at this housing element again. But I'm asking for the summertime, we need to have a workshop on the housing element, what this all means, how, how, how the process is run, so that the people of Laverne can have a better heads up and understanding of how they can be effective, what they need to comment on, and what is, what, what is actually important in these binders that are this thick. I do this for a living, I know, I know how easy it is to fool everybody, and that's exactly what's being done. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Gamaldon. Anyone else wish to speak on item four? Ms. Bond. Good evening again, Council, Ms. Ramp. Um, I actually read these things, and there's a lot of pages. Um, on page 52, and I'm not sure how it correlates with your packet, but it talks about ADUs. And it says, survey and evaluate potential methods to encourage ADU development throughout the community. I'm not sure if that's the city's responsibility. Maybe, maybe it is. But it goes on to say, in areas of highest or of high or highest opportunity, North Laverne. North Laverne's been pointed out in this thing various times. Again, who decides this? It's staff. The word staff, we've had this discussion before. Somebody puts together this report, correct? So who is it? I, I hope I can get an answer. Let me, I'll go ahead and finish. Maybe I can get an answer. Um, it says, continue educating the community on the opportunity to develop ADUs. Again, not quite sure if that's the city's responsibility um, to promote something, to develop it. And uh, obviously geared towards low-income housing. Encourage the production of 92 ADUs. Who's going to do that? The city's going to go out to the residents to encourage 92 ADUs, and how do they do that? Who's going to do it? With a goal of 50%, so that's 46 units, being affordable to very low or low income households. Um, the next, again, I, I don't know how this is set up, but the next column. It says, um, update information about ADUs annually. Meet with an HOA, meet with one HOA per year to provide education on ADUs with a focus, with, with a focus on connecting with a HOAs in North Laverne. Again, north of Baseline, pointed out. Trying to figure out who would do this and why. And then on page 54, now this identifies 50% of the 92 ADUs. On the next page you're talking about provide adequate sites for lower income housing, but the goal is only 20%. So somehow Northern Laverne is being pointed out as 50%, yet the overall goal seems to be 20. 
So the inconsistencies here are very interesting. And also it says sites, this is the one that caught my eye, sites rezoned by October 2024. That's an interesting observation. And again, it says in progress. What does that mean? So I agree with Cynthia. There's a lot of information in here, but a lot of information that is um, not very clear. So I would hope that there's a lot of clarification before we start dictating who and what does what. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bowen. Anyone else? Mr. Capito. Joseph Galvin on 259 Hammer Street. Um, I just have a question. Has any of the revealed new information regarding the Fairplex development and the 10,000 units of plan there in proximity to Laverne been included or amended within the plan? Thank you, Mr. Galvin. Do we have a raised hand here? Everybody took the left. Turn your phone, man. Turn your phone. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Uh, if you can hear me, okay. I have some things to do. This is a uh, housing element. Uh, actually, my name is Lily Brando. I live in 7th Street, a uh, resident area in Old Town. So I do care about, um, I try to learn about from the agenda. Actually, I not really quite understand that because uh, I did remodel two, three years ago. Yeah, it's kind of complicated. But now I really uh, care about if my neighbor, they will sell their house, become apartment, come to like a commercial, become commercial, or even say you ADU because uh, follow the new law. Probably I don't really have the chance to say no. So I try to connect with them, see if you will sell house or Maybe I ask somebody else to still buy the house and then still resident. So uh, I do agree uh, with the uh, uh, workshop idea because I, I think we really need to learn about uh, the future. Well, late, 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 late. <laughs> Can you turn your screen? We're all going to get sick. <laughs> you're, done, you're sideways. The, I turned the uh, video off, so you hear me better? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. <laughs> we got gotcha. you. We heard. Stay away from any, any speaker. So I do agree with the uh, workshop idea because I try to learn about the agenda, about the ADU, and then about future maybe zoning changing. Uh, as a resident, we really uh, need to know about our environment in coming future. Uh, especially I live in Old Town, so probably my my neighbor, they all have big properties. So it could, will it happen, they become commercial or become like the, some uh, apartment? Uh, it's just really uh, have my concern. So I do think about the workshop if the environment is left rest and know more about our future. That's, that's quite important. And also uh, the, 10,000 unit in Pomona is very close to my house too. So I definitely would like to know the update. Yeah, thank you so much. <coughs> Any other public comment on this item? Another hand raised, I'm gonna close public comment. Bring it back up to the dais. 
I just want to remind everything, this is a receive and file item. So um, you're, you're, uh, you've all been heard, and uh, we'll, uh, as we move forward, we'll bring it back to the public, I think, also. Mr. Kilmer? Yeah, and just to reiterate, this is uh, last year the city went through, and before that, the housing element update. Um, and approve the housing element submitted to the here. state. Um, this is nothing on that process that we went through. This is an annual report for housing production. So if there were, I'm you know, just pulling out, you know, there were 50 units completed last year, and you know, 25% of them were uh, low mod, it's reported on these forms. These are state forms, and yes, they're actually kind of ugly. And I wish uh, in other cities we'd try to deal with HCD to get the form different. Um, I think we can work a little bit better, but they'd be very small um, if we shrunk them down. So, um, you know, the goal was to get information. But this is not um, anything to do with the housing element. That's already certified. This is just looking back the, the last year and looking at what has been produced or what is in process and theoretically will be produced this year. And then of course next year before April, we'll bring the next APR, Annual Progress Report, back and report on those units. So it's a, the state's way of collecting data from cities. Um, but again, it doesn't have anything to do with the process that the city went through last year in its approval of the housing element. Uh, we'll be doing that again in probably seven years, because it's an eight year cycle. Um, but I do want to let people know that the general plan uh, process is ongoing, and that's an additional way to get some information. Real quick on the Fairplex units, we wouldn't report on those because they're not in our jurisdiction. Um, so Pomona would be reporting on those. When that specific plan eventually gets approved, and that's going to be a long process, when any development goes forward, uh, you know, will be a participant and such that will comment, but also when something is being developed, then we're going to be looking at the traffic impacts and able to comment on the environmental impact report and any traffic analysis. So uh, that's when we'll have more of an active role in units that are outside of our jurisdiction. Thank you, Mr. Domer. With that, do we need a, a Councilor Barlow, we need, uh, I mean, uh, City Attorney Barlow, we need a vote on this, is that correct? Or it's just a receiving file? It's, it's a receiving file. So we consider that vote. We move on to. to receive and file, and we'll also be a vote. Also be a motion to receive and file. They don't have the mics. Motion to receive and file. Second. Second. To receive and file. Let's do it. There you go. That was approved. 5 0. We move on to public hearings, Mr. Domer. Yes, you do, Mr. Mayor. Um, the first public hearing I'd like to call up, who am I calling up? The Acting Chief of Police, Sam Gonzalez. This is on the Assembly Bill 481 Annual Review. And this is an annual progress now. It's kind of a, uh, I'll say, a wonky way of reviewing stuff because it actually forces us through state legislation to once again pass an ordinance um, just to be able to list the inventory. And there's an annual report also that goes along with the item. But uh, Chief Gonzalez? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. City Manager. I actually have uh, Lieutenant Leeper here who's in charge of the program for our military equipment. He's also in charge of our SWAT team who will uh, introduce the matter uh, for you today. Good evening. Uh, I have no leaf blowers or jam, so I apologize. <laughs> you did not come prepared. I did not. Uh, so for those who don't know me, my name is Corey Leeper. I'm a lieutenant here at, at uh, the police department. And I'm here to present uh, the first reading for our 41 annual report. Uh, some refer to it as the military equipment uh, report. Uh, to give you some background, uh, Assembly Bill 41 went into effect on January 1, 2022, requiring law enforcement agencies to obtain approval from this governing body, that's you, the council, to enact the military equipment use policy before purchasing, using, raising funds, or acquiring military equipment. Now, that equipment is outlined within the bill. There are 14 categories. 
In addition, each agency must submit an annual report, which is what I'm uh, uh, here to do tonight for the, for the first reading, uh, to the governing body detailing the equipment used in the preceding year. The report allows the governing body and the public to review and determine whether each type of military equipment identified in the report has complied with the standards for approval set forth by AB 41 and vote on whether to renew it uh, in accordance with Government Code 7071E2. The bill also requires the department uh, to, to allow the public to review the annual report and provide comments during a public hearing, which is what this is tonight, after the first reading of the amended ordinance. The policy and the inventory was posted on our website on January, January 7, 2023. Uh, there's some small mobile changes. Uh, we did uh, return some antiquated equipment to the military, including an armored vehicle that was 40 years old, and a, a robot that no longer worked. And we also included a uh, purchase of a Lincoln Bearcat, which you, you council approved. Uh, so with that, I'd like to answer any questions that you have for me. Council, do you have any questions for Lieutenant Leeper before we go to public comment? We'll go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Leeper. I'm sure we might have some questions afterwards. We're going to go ahead and open public comment. Is there any public comment on this item? Nothing on the. Uh, no, that's it. Right. We're going to close public comment. Bring it up to the dais. Council member, any comments? Then I will, Mr. Gilmer, please read the title of ordinance number one 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 five. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ordinance number 1115, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Laverne, County of Los Angeles, State of California, amending Chapter 10, Military Equipment Policy, of Title IX, Section 10.04.010 of the Laverne Municipal Code governing the use of military equipment by the Department and approving the updated Military Equipment Policy 709. I move to approve. Second. Vote, please. That item was approved by vote. Thank you, Town Leaper. You're just so thorough. Resolution amending fees for concealed carry weapons, CCW permits. Mr. Domer, please introduce staff member and who will be reporting. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to introduce Acting Chief Sam Gonzalez to come on up to the podium. I'm sure he will have assistance with, from Lieutenant Chris Transfields. Uh, Mr. Heffern, under an abundance of caution, I'm considering um, refusing myself from this just because I've already applied for a CCW. Um, I would be best interest if I just step down. Yeah, just want to weigh in. Um, there is no legal conflict um, for Councilmember Johnson. Certainly can accuse himself if he feels that would be um, in the best interest of the city on this side. I respect Mr. Johnson's uh, request and you may accuse yourself, sir. Acting Chief Gonzalez, please continue. Thank you. Uh, I too didn't bring any uh, gimmicks today. I'm happy to provide you some information. You got to blow your hair though. You know, there was, <laughs> there was candy left over from the excellent adventure. <laughs> I know there was. We had a lot, but that's okay. Kid cats are my favorite. <laughs> well, good evening, uh, Mayor, City Council, Mayor Pro Tem, City Staff. Uh, please forgive me if I'm reading from my notes today, as I want to make sure I, I cover each topic, uh, as it is important for all to understand uh, what we're why we're here today. Uh, the department has heard comments from the public and council related to fees for those seeking a private license to carry a concealed weapon. Uh, with that, it's important to note uh, how we got here. In August of 2022, the LA County Sheriff, Bill Nueva, announced that the department will no longer process CCW applications for those who do not reside in the contracted jurisdictions of the county. With this information, the department began reviewing on how we would take on this new task. We asked ourselves, what does this mean? What does this mean for the, the, the Laverne Police Department? Uh, the Laverne Police Department would now be the mechanism by way if someone chooses to carry concealed may apply to obtain a private license, very similar to a business license or a mayor's license 
uh, as such. Uh, it is important to know that there's a distinction between obtaining a private license to carry concealed and one's decision to go in a gun store and purchase a firearm for the sake of owning it. There's a distinction. We're here just to uh, apply for a CCW, not for anything else. Uh, the department looked at methods utilized by the Sheriff's Department to deliver licenses to individuals uh, in the process of doing so. We heard various comments uh, related to the Sheriff's Department's uh, process. Uh, some comments included that uh, applicants were waiting, wait times were up to two years, some waiting a year, some waiting longer. Um, that, that could be frustrating uh, to many, and I could see why. Uh, the department considered that and looked into why. Uh, we discovered that the Sheriff's Department, like all uh, departments in the San Gabriel Valley and, and beyond, are, are struggling with staffing concerns. So they had a team of three, and as of January 1st, had a cadre of three people to run 4,700 applications. Uh, so there is, there is a, a reason for what, as to why. Now they have a new sheriff. He may change that. Uh, we haven't heard um, on how he's going to do that or if he's going to do that. Uh, the department took this information while looking at other departments to find the best practice of delivering this new service to the community while ensuring that fees are set at a level to recover costs, keeping in mind that recovery of costs may impact overall budgets or may discourage participation. The department put together a team to come up with a palatable process comprised of Sergeant Weinberg, who's back here, and Acting Captain Dranspell. Together, they reviewed staffing levels that impact the processing of application and conducting backgrounds, as well as the cost to do so. Uh, please know that backgrounds are finicky due to the information obtained from the DOJ and the FBI. This information that's brought to us can only be viewed by someone who has the need to know and the right to know. Those rights come with legal, legal waivers and exams. Much, that, much of those have police officers have taken or retired police officers who have the legal right to perform backgrounds. Uh, this exception makes it difficult to have volunteers perform this task. We also looked at removing Sergeant Weinrib from patrol or an investigator from investigations, which would diminish the service we provide to the city and to its residents. Larger agencies have the ability to pull from thousands that they employ. We don't have that luxury. Um, one day I'd love to get to 42 officers. I, I don't have that luxury. Uh, as we continued our quest, the department found that most agencies not completely internalizing the process we're utilizing a company called MyCCW.com. The department's cost analysis for an internal employee, for, for an internal employee conducting a background and a complete report found that it was greater, that the cost was greater by doing it internally than the cost coming from MyCCW. MyCCW charges $398 internally and it would cost approximately $978 per applicant for the background alone. Now the following slide here uh, is where what represents where we're currently at. Uh, you will see that at the top there's a $150 uh, administrative fee, uh, coupled with my CCW fee at $398, a fingerprint roll fee, which has been the standard um, since I arrived in Laverne in early 2000, a DOJ fee of $93, a firearms training fee of $250, a psycho uh, psychological exam fee of $150 a CCW card fee of $20 for the total cost of $1,081 uh, to an applicant. Now keep in mind that some of those fees are not uh, receivable to the city, of, uh, the city of Laverne or the department. The fees that are applicable to the city of uh, Laverne, and this uh, slide here uh, represents the administrative fee, the fingerprint roll fee, and the, and the I'm sorry, and the CCW card fee. At the, at the bottom there. The remaining costs are uh, sent to the DOJ. Uh, the firearms training fee is to the actual vendor of, uh, selected by the applicant. And then, uh, I believe that was all the fee, if I'm not mistaken. Since, it, since uh, bringing this to City Council, the department has redoubled its efforts uh, ensuring that we remain fiscally prudent when determining an updated fee schedule. As indicated in the staff report, the department is proposing to lower its administrative fee from $150 to 
eliminating the cost of the CCW identification card of twenty dollars, which you will see on the next screen. And in the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, here indicates the, the reduced cost that we're looking at in the CCW administrative fee of, of $100. Uh, that'll cover the processing time for records clerks, records supervisor, and a police chief to interview an applicant, um, which is a subsidy um, in our cost analysis, uh, analysis of $36 per applicant. Again, the CCW roll fee is not an, a new addition. It's been, it's been part of our uh, fee schedule for many years. The below chart uh, indicates uh, the addition of a $10 fee for amendments. If someone uh, loses their card or would like to add a, a different weapon to their card, um, that would cover uh, changes in their card listing the, the weapons of their choice. Um, and lastly, the CCW renewal fee is $25. It was $52, and that was a title error on our part. Um, we are bringing that up to the current standard of $25 for renewals. As I move on, uh, you may recall from our previous uh, presentation by uh, Acting Captain Dranspell, our initial recommendation was to require applicants to have a psychological exam to provide a police chief who will ultimately issue the license of the, the, the private license with the information in the best interest of the public. The department will be relying on the information from the DOJ and the information obtained from the background to determine the need for a psychological assessment. On the next slide, please. I'm, I, I'm sorry that it's hard to see, but uh, if we can zoom in on it. These are some of the categories that are provided uh, within the Department of Justice uh, report. Uh, this could also be found online uh, for those who wish to, to, to view those, uh, the, pro the prohibiting uh, cases for those for those instances, both it includes both misdemeanors and felonies um, in each slide thereafter. So if you may go to the next slide, it also includes, um, uh, this is for misdemeanors here. And this again lists the different codes in there. Majority of this list, if anyone would like any more information, can also be found on the DOJ's website uh, of the prohibitions listed for firearms uh, in Octavia and CCW. Next slide, please. you will see the uh, current proposal uh, consists of fees without the psych psychological exam which is proposed before you here today. The administrative fee of $100, a 390 MyCCW fee will, will continue. We have now listed, uh, eight, uh, there's entities in which an applicant can select from uh, ranging from $175 to $250 for the applicant choice. Uh, in this instance, to achieve that total, we're using the 175 fee, not the 250 that we previously uh, incorporated, the high amount, we're using the low amount. The $93 in the DOJ fee, the $20 roll fee, uh, for a total of $786 um, in this slide here. If the council directs the staff to maintain its position to adding the psychological, that fee would increase to $936 when adding the fee of $150, which will be in the next slide. Thank you. Again, here's the administrative fee of $100. The MyCC, this is the cost to the applicant in total. $100 and uh, admin, admin fee, as I mentioned, the MyCCW fee of $398, fingerprint uh, roll fee of $20, the DOJ fee of $93, the firearms training of $175, psychological exam of $150 for a grand total of $936. Um, in the next slide, you will see a comparison with the current cost uh, before you here today. In yellow, you will see Laverne. It is yellow, right? Yeah. In 
and in yellow, you'll see where the bird sits uh, today with the, with the proposal in front of you, as it sits in the county. Yeah. So it was recently updated uh, as of when it was uh, presented. To, uh, yes. Uh, it is important to know that the departments, uh, the department surveyed various agencies and found that almost every agency was not returning 100% of the licensing process, which remains a consideration to amend the fee schedule before you tonight. The department continues to monitor the fees associated with the issuance of CCW licenses. And as recent as last week, the Los Angeles County Sheriff has requested that the fees be raised via the Board of Supervisors. The previous chart uh, here, the chart here, uh, does not reflect the recent request by the Sheriff. So there will be an increase by the Sheriff. Yeah. Lastly, the Department is monitoring uh, California legislation. Uh, we are working on a new bill, Senate Bill 2, which will update allowable fees and restructuring the applicable concealed carry license requirement. If passed, the Department expects changes as soon as January 1st, 2024. As such, uh, before you are the department's recommendations to amend resolution 23-10. Before I conclude, I will also ask that if anyone has any questions to contact Sergeant Weinrath with regards to the process, our, uh, the website, if there's any issues uh, with that. i also like to note that within our department, if someone does not have a computer, uh, our department uh, in the lobby of the computer there is uh, can be utilized to apply for a CCW if they don't have a, a, an email, for instance. Someone can ask Sergeant Weiner for assistance to upload any documents that may be needed uh, that we can assist with. So those, uh, those with ADA requirements or those who simply do not have a computer or the internet at home can come to the police department and use our uh, lobby computer uh, to apply for a CCW as well. We ask that they uh, contact the relative first, uh, and we may be your last resort if need be. Uh, I'm here available for any questions that need be. Thank you, Acting Chief Gonzalez. Um, Council, do we have any questions before you move to public comment for Mr. Gonzalez? I have a couple clarifying questions. Go ahead. Um, a couple clarifying questions, too, is that uh, there are places that people that even have a CCW are not allowed to carry uh, their, their weapon. Is that true? Mm -hmm. That is correct. That, that is correct. Um, in the penal code section, there's actually six locations uh, the California penal code uh, describes that uh, people shouldn't carry. Uh, one of them is, if you may recall, the California State Schools, uh, penal code 629.9. Um, the other one is a 171B PC, which is public meetings. Uh, second, uh, or third, I should say, 171C into government buildings. Uh, 171D, the governor's mansion, 171.5 is airports, and 171.7, uh, public transit facilities. Those are all listed in the penal code uh, as locations that uh, are prohibited. To I just want to make it clear because I know I received a lot of emails today about our schools. And even though um, someone, if they even had a CCW, they still would not be able to carry legally a gun into our schools. According to the penal code, it's yeah. Thank you. I just want to make sure because that's, I received a lot of emails about um, safety of our schools and stuff there too, so I just want to make sure. Um, the, another question on your, you had two proposals, proposal one with no uh, psychological tests and the second proposal with psychological tests. If uh, through your interviews um, on the first one with no psychological tests, through your interviews, if you deem a psychological test would be needed, then then. Um, you can request one. Is, is that part of your proposal? That is correct. The California Penal Code Section uh, 216, I shouldn't try to go off of memory, uh, allows for that. Thank you. Councilmember Lau. If I can just further clarify, the need for a psychological exam in that first one is based on not just the interview, but on the information received through the background check. Correct? That, that is correct. Thank you. That's where we're captured. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, it's just, I'm asking uh, about uh, the renewal. I didn't hear it. Uh, the site, is that part of the renewal as well? No, that is not. For one time there, there is a, uh, in the penal code, there is a, a line for uh, a requirement of a site, but there, sure. it, it's really, there has to be much, a greater need for it. In order to do it 
They get it every day. Correct. So it's just a one time. The one time. Kind of call it law enforcement when we went through it. Same thing. Correct. Just a couple more questions. Um, so when you purchase a gun, you go through a background check. It's a two week hold. Is that correct? <coughs> two week list. On generally on a handgun. I believe it's 10 day. Is it 10 day? 10 day hold. And that's thorough. Now for the CCW, they do a background check with three forms of uh, people uh, that you know, or just a, a background check for people. Uh, what's what am I looking for? She told me. Yeah, references. Nice of references. So three references. Um, at that point, as Councilmember Lau stated, and also Councilmember Crosby, that the fact is those in themselves, once you do the CCW background, they're going to give you indication that either this individual is okay to proceed with after they do all their CCW, they do the test, they do the certification, that this person okay. It will highlight anything to do with psychological issue that they deem necessary after their um, the CCW background and their check? Not 100% of the time. Okay, so you would get an application and what we're saying is that the chief of police would be the ultimate uh, individual to, uh, if they saw something in the paperwork that they would say, we're going to move for a psychological test here, and we feel that, that they feel that that's necessary. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, what we're going to be relying on is information from the background, from the DOJ, compile that data, uh, and the report when it comes to the chief of police, uh, we'll make that determination. But that doesn't necessarily always give us the information. Not 100% of the time. I cannot say that with certainty. So basically, $786 is the estimate for what we're currently proposing. But if we add the uh, $150 psychological exam, that's going to bring us to 936. Is that correct? That was correct. Okay. Thank you, Acting Chief Gonzalez. I think we'll go ahead and move to public comment. If we have any further questions, bring it up. I'll be good. We have some uh, public comment. Mr. Reeves, come on up. If I may ask, we'll keep these to three minutes, please. I think there's going to be a lot of speakers, but. Um, Steve Reeves, 2811 Pineland. Mayor, members of the council, citizens of the Today I return to you to speak about the high and so carry fees. We have gone from the highest in the nation to simply exorbitant. I want to thank you for starting the process, but we are not there yet. As of this morning, Florida has a permitless carry. Within a few more weeks, South Carolina and Nebraska will follow. This will bring to 28 the number of states which do not require a permit for their citizens to carry a firearm. All other states are now shall issue. If objective criteria are met, a permit must be issued. Yet Laverne is mired in the old discriminatory may issue past. This may issue past, which gives the chief of police arbitrary discretion in issuing concealed carry permits has been thrown out by the Supreme Court. The decision to keep my CCW is unfortunate. My CCW was designed to help navigate the burdensome May issue process under the old arbitrary regime. The majority of things that my CCW assisted with are now completely unnecessary, under Bruin, or redundant to the city's in-house process. It is both unfortunate and negligent that the city did not either negotiate lower fees with my CCW or eliminate use of the program altogether. The last time I was here, I appealed to your sense of justice. I suggested that the fees were discriminatory and made it impossible for widows, single moms, minorities, and other economically disadvantaged people to obtain a permit. Now I appeal to your sense of stewardship. As stewards of the city's treasury, you have a responsibility to spend our dollars wisely. Lawsuits take time and money. Laverne will reduce their fees. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. The question is, how much time and how much money do you want to spend in the process? I have waited eight years to get a CCW from the city of Laverne. I really hate to wait longer, but sometimes you are required to draw a line in the sand. Tonight, that line has been drawn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Ms. Bochan. Oh. 
primary reasoning behind not charging excessive fees for a CCW license is to ensure that the right to bear arms is accessible to as many law-abiding citizens as possible. The Second Amendment to the United States Constitution guarantees the right to bear arms, and many Americans believe that that is important enough to be able to defend themselves and their families. Excessive fees for a CCW license will create a financial barrier to those who wish to exercise their Second Amendment rights. This could dis disproportionately impact lower socioeconomic individuals, which those are normally the ones living in the areas of higher crime rates who are most affected by the ability to defend themselves. Furthermore, if the fees for a CCW license are too high, it could also discourage the people from obtaining the necessary training and education to safely carry and use a firearm, which could then lead to higher risk of accidents, injuries, or even fatalities. CCW license is a nonpartisan issue because it is a matter of personal safety and individual rights, not political ideology. Both Democrats and Republicans support the right to bear arms and many people from all other political backgrounds believe in responsible gun ownership and the importance of protecting oneself and one's family. It is important for the, <clears throat> to balance the need for public safety with the protection of individual rights. Therefore, it is essential that fees for CCW license are reasonable and do not present an undue burden on law-abiding citizens. Administrative costs. While it is reasonable to charge a fee to cover the administrative costs associated with the CCW license applications, excessive fees may be difficult to justify. If the fees are charged substantially higher than the actual cost of administering the program, it could be seen as a revenue generating measure rather than a legitimate cost to cover. I ask that the city reconsider that these fees are still an excessive amount as the chart that was presented to the residents. City of Glendora, which is one of the neighboring communities, is over $300 less than what you're proposing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bocan. If you could remind you to please state your name and your address, if you could please, uh, you get to the mic. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. My name is Wendy Lamalo of Address 172 Bryn Mawr Road. Um, I am a resident of your neighboring community in Claremont and a proud mother of, of Spartan, of Damien Spartan, and a former graduate of Damien. Um, so I'm very familiar with the lovely community. Um, I am a member of, uh, of a local volunteer with Moms Demand Action serving the Pomona Valley, um, which includes Claremont, Pomona, and Laverne. Um, and we represent the largest bipartisan grassroots uh, movement of over 10 million supporters working toward common sense gun laws for safer communities. We strongly support strong concealed carry permit standards um, and the work of our state attorney general and state senator Portantino on SB2, um, which include many of the provisions that you have today. Um, I, I stand here um, in support of strong concealed carry permit standards as we are as a nation. We've just experienced 10,698 gun deaths in three months in three days. That's more than triple the time of victims in 9-11, and well exceeds the number of military personnel uh, that were killed in our Afghanistan war that lasted two decades. That's shameful. So yes, we believe in strong standards for our permit carry system. Um, guns are also now the death, the number one killer of our children. And I don't just say that as a statistic, it's personal. We recently lost um, a Damien alum, a 19-year-old young boy, um, to gun suicide. And one of the most common ways um, this occurs is because a young person gets a hold of a gun that's not safely secured. Um, so more guns in more hands in more places do not make us safer. <coughs> they do put us at greater risk. And so reasonable standards based on reasonable costs that you've presented 
um, are justified. And so I, mm -hmm. I strongly support um, this council moving forward with um, the well-deliberated de process um, that you set forth. But I'd also encourage you strongly to not just in the wake of the covenant shooting and more dead children and dead ch teachers, not let this be your one and only action immediately following that incident. Let's work together on educating the public on safe storage, which is also California law, which should be required in your training as a key component. Um, and let's educate the public together on gun violence restraining orders. You're right, you're absolutely correct. The chief was correct. The data that you're going to get from DOJ is not going to flag all the mental health concerns that are, that are there and are present. Um, they don't just get published in the paper. And again, I say this as a person, as a human being that has experienced this. I had a loved one who had a mental health crisis. And there were guns in the home. And at the time, we didn't have our red flag laws. And at the time, the sheriff's department refused to help when we called. It was easier to criminalize that family member than it was to remove the weapon. We can't proceed with this. It's just not civilized. Thank you. Thank you for your support on this lesson. Thank you, Ms. Ramola. We have Nancy Sossman. Nancy Sassaman, 2700 Hillcrest Drive. I'm a member of the Hillcrest Retirement Community, and I want to thank you for the privilege of being able to speak. I'll be very brief. I'm not here to change the CCW process. The Supreme Court's already made that decision for me. <clears throat> But I am here to exercise my First Amendment rights to say that we need to slow our role towards militarization of communities. When I see the costs of military equipment that the police department needs, it's a little frightening. Okay, I can see some of it. Yeah, robot, yeah, okay. A 44 milli a 40 millimeter, I don't know. But that's not really why I'm here. It's that we seem to believe that the idea is we need more. More guns, more military equipment, more rising to being reactive and making people afraid. We need to strengthen our background checks. We need to safeguard our guns. We need to strengthen our standards. At Hillcrest, two years ago, we changed our policy that you could no longer have a gun on campus. We have gun collectors. We have people who have firearms, but they are not allowed to keep them on our campus because we know that one bad day can shorten someone's life. We've spent a lot of time listening to people talk about money and costs and money and costs and how much it's going to cost and what it's going to cost to train all of the police the personnel that will need to be able to use this equipment and what it's going to cost for a psychological check. But we never once mentioned the cost of a human life. And that's more important than anything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Sussman. Thank you. Jerry Best. And I misstated on my blue card that I wanted to make a statement during public comments that I wanted to speak to this issue. Sherry Best, I live at 3949 Bradford Street. To Honorable Mayor Tim Hepburn, members of the City Council, City Manager Domer and City Attorney Barlow. Overall, Resolution 2314, which amends Resolution 2310, represents a responsive 
and responsible reduction of fees for CCW permits in the borough. The reduction of city administrative fees from $150 to $100, elimination of the $20 CCW permit card fee, and maintenance of firearm safety training with access to vendors offering a reduced rate of $175 are responsive to residents' concerns and serve to reduce the initial cost of a CCW permit to comparable costs in adjacent cities. However, the elimination of a psychological evaluation as a cost-cutting measure is not acceptable. The psychological evaluation should be a necessary component for a CCW permit. Any chance that an unstable person would be denied access to a weapon is a chance worth taking. I would hate to face someone whose loved one was murdered and tell them that the person who committed the crime was saved $150 in a decision to reduce his or her permit application costs. Nor is a CCW permit an inalienable right. A CCW permit does not prevent purchasing a gun and keeping it at home. Of course, we must remind ourselves that keeping a gun at home is no guarantee that it will be handled responsibly. Remember that only the other week, a six-year-old brought a gun to school in Virginia and shot his teacher. I do not feel safer or more secure knowing that I could be shot at the grocery store, in church, or at a public gathering by a responsible gun owner who acts irresponsibly. The argument that responsible people shoot people responsibly was belied by the incident on June 14, 2019 at a Costco store in Corona in which an off-duty LAPD officer fatally shot a developmentally disabled man and critically injured his parents. Store security tapes showed the victims backing away from the officer and pleading with him not to shoot before he fired 10 rounds. Charged with voluntary manslaughter, the shooter was not indicted by a grand jury, but he was fired from the police force and the surviving parents of the murdered victim were ultimately awarded $17 million. We can argue that the officer in this incident felt he was acting to protect his toddler son and or felt himself to be under threat. But if he were armed only with his fists, the dead adult son of the wounded couple might still be alive today. People who train to become police officers must pass rigorous and regular firearms training, background checks, and psychological evaluations. I know this from my brother-in-law, who was on the Long Beach Police Department for over 20 years. Despite their training, when placed in situations in which they have the option to use deadly force, events still occur. Citizens who are arguably less skilled in actual weapons use and less likely to encounter emergency situations in which they must exercise immediate judgment about applying deadly force are even less predictable. A psychological evaluation could help determine who might be likely to resort to deadly force. It is certainly not the case that I would feel safer knowing that my fellow citizens are armed, however well-intentioned and responsible they feel they are. Subscribing to the belief that guns don't kill people, people kill pe people, ignores the reality that firearms are both a versatile and more deadly form of attack because they can be used immediately and from a distance. Stated another way, we can say people kill people with guns. The NRA approved quote that guns don't kill but people do the killing is my strong endorsement for psychological evaluation of the very people who want to carry guns. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beth. <laughs> Mayor, can we go to the uh, three phone callers, please? Awesome. And then we'll bring more people up.
My name is Anini Brano. I really have something to say um, about CCW. And uh, I'm glad this uh, information show kind of clear tonight. Uh, since the uh, lower the beat just a little bit, I'm so surprised because uh, the surround city, they all have this uh, pretty much like a high high fee, so, but it's still not reasonable. Just the whole California city, even everybody has that fee, that is still doesn't mean reasonable. I am just thinking if our city too small to be special, I have to follow the crowd, follow everybody's expenses, so that's it. So I'm very clear, uh, no 10 amendments, people should not murder. So so people, gun not kill people, yeah, you know, gun not kill people, people say. The 10 amendment six very clear, you should not, you shall not murder. So, and then the school shooting just happened. The, the gun, gun, man or woman, I, I have so confused right now. He or she legally buys for seven guns, legal. So that means the permit didn't really, doesn't really stop anything. So just the person, if the person want to kill, not just gun, he can use a chalk, use a car, use a knife, use everything, blow, right, everything. So it's just really, I have something to say. It's our right, second to eight, our, our right to have a gun as a minority, as a woman. $700 is really stop most people to think about having a gun. So I hope uh, you, city will consider that. So half a country, so many other states, they maybe it's still be become a chain, you know, we don't really need C CCW anymore in the future. It could it could happen because the country is changing very dramatically. It's not party problem. It doesn't matter which party you belong. So to have a bare arm is our right to protect ourselves. As a woman, stay home, walk from home, I definitely know I need I need this one. This buy arm to protect my family. But seven hundred dollar is definitely stop most people. So it's just not right. I hope this situation could be changed. Yeah, thank you so much. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Bye. This is Marco Langer, and I'm uh, state senator. Okay. Anthony Portantino's representative for this. Portantino, Attorney General Rob Bonta, Governor Gavin Newsom, are in the final stages of passing a uniform California CCW permitting process in line with the recent Supreme Court decision. It seems prudent for the city of Laverne to wait until that law passes before creating a local effort that may not be consistent with, with state law. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> we have uh, Barbara Smythe. That's important to those office. Good evening, wonderful Mayor Tillman. Heffron and the rest of the city council. Um, I live at 2644 Mountain View Drive, um, part of the Hillcrest crew, um, and was part of those um, decisions that we made about that. Um, maybe this whole thing is a moot point if we're not following state guidelines. Uh, that was kind of an interesting comment. Um, I think it's interesting we keep talking about the Second Amendment, which also includes the right to bear arms to form a militia. And we never talk about the militia part, and I'm quite content with our police department. Uh, as 
being able to protect me. So um, I am concerned about this uh, bill because um, one of the things that I noticed this time is that you had spent a lot of time responding to the residents' concerns about cost and had reduced the cost to the city and to the residents, which I thought was quite remarkable, um, kind of win-win. Um, but the part that it concerned me was the part about uh, psychological evals. Um, I just think they're essential, and I don't think it should be left in the hands of the chief of police to make that kind of decision uh, without uh, mental health uh, credentials. Um, it's a tremendous burden, and uh, you know I would hate to have to make that kind of decision. Um, and I think it would be very tough uh, for the council if we had a tragedy in this community and we had to explain why we had reduced the cost of eval and made it more optional. Um, that that would be a hard conversation. Um, I don't think anybody would want to have that. So we need to take care of our residents, too. Thank you very much. Mr. Perry. Wayne Perry, did you want to speak? No, public this? comment. Public yes. comment? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Anybody else wish to speak on this item? Oh, Hello, Costas Morris, on behalf of the California Rifle and Pistol Association. I wasn't actually going to speak tonight because I need to discuss with my client these changes. Uh, however, I do want to thank the city for having me here again. It's always a pleasure. I noticed that you guys have more attendance than cities many times your size at the city council meeting, so that's good to see uh, that level of public engagement. However, um, I, I do feel compelled to speak today to clear up a few facts here. Uh, we heard that we saw the listing of other cities uh, and their fees. Um, although Laverne has moved down the list, thankfully, that's progress. Uh, a lot of those other cities also use MyCCW. So that's the big differentiator here is the $398 that MyCCW charges, whereas cities that don't use it are uh, significantly cheaper uh, in price. Um, this, a uh, couple other points, this uh, figure about gun deaths, 10,000 a year, it's true, but it includes suicides, which make up over half the count. And of course, a CCW permit has nothing to do with suicide. If you have a gun um, and you're unfortunately dealing with a depressive episode, it's not going to matter if you have a permit or not. Suicide is not usually done in public. It's done, sadly, in one's home. So that won't actually have any bearing on this. Um, and of course, people with carry permits almost never commit crimes. There are outliers, of course, like with anything. But one of the reasons the Sheriff's Association uh, opposed Senator Portantino's last effort to pass this bill, which failed last year, SB 918, was because they said that the legislation was not needed because their experience had showed that people who get these permits, people who willingly come to a city or a county and say, I would like to do this legally, I'll pay your fees, I'll take your course, they're very unlikely to ever commit crimes. And remember, most California counties have been shall issue for many years in practice because this was left to the sheriff. So you had tons of counties, including Riverside, San Bernardino, uh, Orange uh, County have moved in that direction recently. Um, so most of these counties have been, have been this way for years and haven't had the surge of people with, you know, committing crimes or, um, or people with psychological episodes suddenly going crazy and shooting everyone. And remember, most of these places do not require psych exams either because, again, this is something that comes up in your background check if you've ever been institutionalized, if you've ever had that kind of episode that would cause a record. That's, that's something that would prevent you not just from getting a permit but from buying a gun. Um, I have one other point here. Um, well, I'm drawing a blank, so I guess I'll stop there. Thank you, Council. Thank you. <laughs> Again, please state your name and address if you don't mind, please. For our records. Um, Estella Maldonado, uh, 1225 Vargo Street, Laverne. Thank you, Mayor. City Council and the City uh, Administration. Um, I want to talk to you today about two numbers, which I will get to in a second. Um, it seems that today, the gist of the, today's conversation has been about numbers and the cost. 
Um, an average year, gun violence in America kills 40,000 people and wounds potentially twice as many. And that, has, and that has an economic consequence to our nation of $557 billion. That's 2.6% of the U.S. gross domestic product. The staggering figure of $557 billion is five times the nation's budget for Department of Education, which funds preschool through college for millions of Americans. Again, this $557 billion problem represents the costs of a lifetime uh, associated with gun violence. And the costs are broken up into three categories. There's the immediate cost, the cost of, you know, during the incident, calling the police department, the fire department, the um, medical assistance, um, the uh, uh, ambulances, and so on. Anything that represents a cost on, during the incident. Then there are the subsequent costs, the support, um, physical and mental uh, support to the victims and even to the perpetrator. This is important because this is where mental illness and, and the mental um, instability of a person is highlighted after the fact. Instead of highlighting it before, which you know, something like the psychological assessment would aim to identify. And then lastly, there's the quality of life cost because people who, you know, just think of the children who have been in the presence of a mass shooter and have had to climb up through windows and hide under their dead classmates and think of what that is going to do to their lives and the costs associated for that child growing to be an adult to experience sometimes more than once gun violence. The, the cost that it's having on that person, that family, on us, all society, this country. The average annual cost for overall gun violence in the United States, and this is the first number, the average annual cost of overall gun violence in the United States is $1,698 for every resident in the country. In comparison to the $1,081, this is higher. And now, you know, I know you're trying to look for savings. So if it goes down to $700, this is twice as high of what we are all paying. If we take away the emotional, the human life, which is the second number, priceless, the loss of our loved ones is priceless. If, if you take that aside from this conversation and you wanna discuss just numbers, well, you're looking at doing the right thing and including the right mental health professional, which no disrespect to chief of police or anybody else that's being enlisted to do this, that is not their skill, that is not their education, their training. And unless they have that, and unless they, they were hired to perform that very important, very specialized um, task, then it's, it's irrelevant. Um, so we either somewhat manage the, um, the overall cost by ensuring that we have psychological analysis and all the necessary uh, requirements to assign and grant this CCW permit. Or the 16, 1,600 and something figure that it's costing us to live with the gun, gun violence that this country is experiencing every day that's only gonna go higher. <coughs> at, at present, California ranks very among the top of the country for um, very, in various categories regarding gun safety, including keeping guns out of, the, out of the wrong hands. We score high as a state. Let, let's keep that. We're not saying take away guns, but 
Not everybody needs a gun in their hand because they just don't have the mental capacity, emotional capacity to deal with that. Ms. Maldonado, we could finish our thoughts. Okay. I am done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else for public comment on this item? Ms. Gabaldon. Yes, Cynthia Gabaldon, 252 Niagara Street. Um, first, I'm going to start off that I am also a Damien mom, longtime Boy Scout mom, lived in the Valley for a long time, has seen a lot of changes around here. First, I'm going to go through numbers and more about nationwide last year. The number of carry permit holders grew by 488,000 at a 2.33% growth over 2021. There are 22 million of us out there, or of those of us who want to be one. If CCWs were the problem, would there be more of our problems across the country? In fact, the, it's actually the opposite. The states with the most shootings are Washington, D.C., and they're two times more than anybody else. The state of Connecticut, of all places, Colorado, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Washington, California, Michigan, Illinois, and New York. These are the states with the strictest regulations on the good guys, and the bad guys know it. So when I hear all these things, and I do a lot of work in areas of the state of California where it's very, very depressed, and there's a lot of gangs, I'm telling you right now, the gangs and the bad guys don't care about any of our laws. That's why they're the bad guys. 8.5% of American adults have permits. Outside of the most restrictive states of California and and New York, about 10.2% of the adults have a permit. In 17 states, more than 10% of adults have permits. Alabama has the highest concealed carry rate, 32.5, Indiana is second at 23.4, and Georgia is third at 15 and a half. Six states now have more than 1 million permit holders. Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and Texas, and Florida has almost 3 million. You never hear about problems in those states. 20, 28 states, since I just heard about two more tonight, have actually adopted um, carry for the entire state, meaning no longer permits are no longer needed. In 2022, women made up 29.2% of the permit holders in the 15 states that have to um, sort it by gender, an increase of 28.3% from the year before. Seven states had data from 2012 to 2022, and the permit numbers grew 115.4% faster for women than for men. I want you to think about that. And this is a fundamental fact that in this country, with so many of these horrible district attorneys, women do not feel safe, and we are not safe. That is just bottom line, and it almost happened again today, and thank goodness the Board of Supervisors pulled it, but they're gonna let out 4,800 criminals out of our county jail, and thank goodness that stopped. This is more than just being a constitutional right, and, um, um, that's what I was going to say, but this is more than just a constitutional right. This is fundamental to our protection, and the only reason why we have the First Amendment, a First Amendment in this country, which we are hanging on by a thread right now, is because of the Second Amendment. Because if we didn't have our firearms, they absolutely would treat us the way my family saw it in East Germany, the way my friends, a lot of my friends from China have seen it, the way it's going on and happened in Hungary, the way it's happened in all these other countries. Do not take this for granted. There's a lot of changes coming. Do we need to make money to end up paying for this? Maybe we do. I was looking up what some of the other cities do. City of Glendora charges $12,000 if you get pulled over for, a, over for a DUI. How about that? We could pull over five people a year and you got your money covered to run this whole program. Um, <laughs> seriously, that's what they do there. And lastly, about safe We're not asking zones, for quotas, sir. Because uh, that question was brought up. 96% of the guns used and these mass shootings, 96% were in the safe zones. Safe zones, the minute you put a big sign out there on top of them, they're a target. Mm -hmm. This is, you have to, Sally, you have to think like the bad guys. Mm -hmm. They're making it easier on them. We're the good guys. We can, we can protect people. I've been shooting since I was five years old. It's not scary. Once you practice, and every woman who's listening to me tonight, you should go to a class and learn how to use a firearm. It will be the most invigorating and powerful thing that you can learn. Um, um, and lastly, I was told, and this is anecdotally, I have to, I have to admit that, that there's about 80 of us or so that, that have actually applied. I've heard that 40 of them-ish are actually either a city employee or, or, or a volunteer. So once we get through that whole 80 group, um, one, so do you think that 
you have 40 or so cuckoo birds that are working here at the city. Like, that's one. I mean, I don't know, there might be something. And then two, um, the other 40 of us, once we're through, you guys might get one or two a year. So I just don't understand why we have to go through my CCW, definitely not that psychological eval, because that's completely, completely being just completely being discriminatory against us, one, but two, it's because of the, the laws we don't have to. And um, just people need to do more research on the truth about gun bias here, here in the U.S. Thank you. Again, please state your name and your address. Yes, sir. Jim Carlson, uh, 1111. Baseline Road. Thank you for your time, Council, um, and getting to speak again. Um, I think our police department does an excellent job. You know why I know that? Because nothing happens in Laverne. Nothing. And we like it that way. Um, I know a lot of law enforcement. I deal with them a lot. I go and deal with investigations and some of the shrewdest <coughs> sharpest people that are able to identify characteristics that are troubling in people are in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. They have an uncanny ability to recognize something ain't right. I think all people could be caught on a good day or a bad day, but I think in general to say that law enforcement is incapable of determining whether someone has the mental capacity to behave themselves, even under moderate stress, is an unreasonable statement. Um, they, they deal with us on a regular basis, whether it's a traffic um, stop or, or any other interaction in the city. I, I just, I feel law enforcement has the mental capacity and the ability to make determinations that are relevant to this. Um, so, I mean, psychological evaluations are always going to be subjective. You, you just don't know. It could be a person that I knew from college and we got along great, or it could have been someone that we didn't get along great, or we were rivals in college or whatever. You just don't know. Um, I do know this. Uh, I do know that, that you guys have made a very concerted effort. I, I can see an, an enormous amount of thought has gone into your decision making and what you're trying to do. I don't know what the, the magic number is, right? I don't think anybody does. I think if we all knew, we'd, we'd all just say, hey, why don't we just make it this number and we'll make this whole thing go away. But one of the things that's different about this process for us as the first group is this is, you know who we are. <laughs> There's no hiding this. You're all going to know. These are the guys that applied because we came. We talked. We told you what our thoughts were. Um, but in general, you would almost never know who this person is. It's not something that's discussed. You can't brandish your firearm at any time. It is an immediate grounds for revocation. Um, me lifting my arms up too high and exposing my sidearm and getting the wrong attention of the wrong person could trigger a call, and he has a duty to act on that. And maybe you get a warning, but there's a good chance you're going to think real long and hard before you want to give up the thousand plus bucks you just spent on getting the right to carry that around with you. Um, it is extremely rare to have someone carrying a CCW participate in gun violence. It is possible. Of course it's possible. Uh, but it's more likely to have the person with the CCW be very careful to take <coughs> close notes, record what's going on, knowing that they've got a shot that if someone did come at them, they could defend themselves to the death if they had to. And they could document the situation better than almost anyone else involved. Um, I don't know where everyone's mind would be under that duress. I've never had a gun pointed at me and been robbed, so I don't know what that feels like. But I gotta believe, I would rather have the option to know that if someone did come at me, I didn't have to just surrender and hope they didn't take it thinking, gosh, I'd prefer he's not an eyewitness to my robbery. I think I'll just shoot him anyways. So that's, to me, that that's one of the biggest question marks that gets posed is, is if the person feels they're better defended and the Constitution allows for it, we should, we should cooperate with that. Um, and I would like to impress on the city, some of us financially, it doesn't matter to me what you charge, but it does to some, and maybe there's a way we could help those people if it's an issue. Um, 
I, I, I hate to hear that a single woman got maimed or killed because she just couldn't afford it and it was something she wanted. Um, and she just happened to not be economically able to live in an area that was as safe as she pr would prefer. Um, those things I think about a lot. But um, I, I, I appreciate the fact that you have come back with so many um, concessions on so many separate points. And, and I'm very grateful for the fact that as impassioned as everybody is tonight, um, everybody has maintained their composure and, and been respectful of one another. And I, I'd like to thank you all for that because I, I think that goes a long way to describing where, wherever you're at on this topic. <laughs> Uh, calm heads usually will get you to the best solution. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Mr. Ramos. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, Mark Ramos, 2247 Second Street. Uh, here in Laverne, resident since 1995. Um, my day job, I'm also president of United Freedom Commercial Workers Local 1428, which in this city represents the folks that work at Bonds, Stater Brothers, CVS, and Rite Aid. Um, mass shootings happen in grocery stores, as you know. Um, mass shootings um, and people who decide to commit violence with a gun. Um, it crosses a lot of lines, whether you're a racist, you're a religious zealot. Um, but the one connecting thing is the gun. Um, to me, more guns is not the answer. More guns puts more people at risk. We ask so much of our police department every single day. Our police officers have to be mediators. They have to be police officers. They have to be psychologists, they have to be coddlers, and they have to be counselors. That I don't see any reason why stepping back and saying, you know what, let's take one extra precaution and make sure there has to be a psychological evaluation. Because nobody here wants to make that mistake that they missed something. Nobody. The last thing we want to have is some dang candlelight vigil out here and talk about thoughts and prayers. While people have their rights, people also have the right to live. A mistake in issuing a CCW to somebody who shouldn't have it because something was missed in a psychological evaluation or the DOJ, as you heard the acting chief say, is an irreversible mistake. A little extra precaution goes a long way. You hear the folks who come up here and talk about advocating for CCW, about all of the training and the caution that goes into what they want to do. Well, that's great. Let's make sure it happens on the other side, too, before someone is allowed to carry uh, an instrument that can make an irreversible mistake. The vast majority of mass shootings happen with legally purchased arms, which means the waiting period, the DOJ background checks, all of those things. I happened to be in Washington, D.C. and was invited to the White House for the, the celebration of the signing of the, uh, the gun bill uh, in July. With me were families from Uvalde, in my industry, the OCW, there were folks from the grocery store in Buffalo. Um, while I hear a lot of folks come up here and say, I need a CCW to protect my family, I worry every day about my family. But I also carry the burden worrying every day about my 4,000 members. That my worry, and when I lay my head down at night, is that every one of my members gets home safe to their families. And there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong. We had the police officers come up here and talk about the military equipment. We have an over-militarized police force that is protecting an over-armed society. 
Gun violence increases because we have more guns. When we talk about Chicago and we talk about these other places, we could probably do away with a lot of gun violence if we actually held gun manufacturers accountable. If we made people get liability insurance with a gun. There's a lot of things that we can do. I, I'll finish the second, sir. I appreciate it. If we could please comments. Mark is at the mic and uh, give him his uh, justice as you guys did when you were speaking. So. This, is, this is really personal to me. Um, like I said, I have to worry about 4,000 people every day, including my, my two sons and my wife. Um, and it means a lot to me. Um, so take it an extra step. Look, while I would encourage you to wait, as Marco said on the bill, it appears that you're going to move forward with this. Taking one extra step of precaution and anybody who deems this as a necessary right, in my opinion, should be opposed to the idea of sitting down and having a psychological evaluation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Roman. Ms. Perry. Good evening, Pam Berry. 2117 Durango Court. Um, I always wonder about this mic. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so here we are tonight. We're, we're not discussing whether we're doing this. You've already decided in a prior meeting $1,100. Almost. Pretty close to that. Okay. So we're here to discuss the reduction. And um, I, somebody recommended possibly dropping or renegotiating my CCW. I think that would be a good idea to at least look into how can that be renegotiated. What are they doing that would be duplicating something else that is part of the, um, the processing of the city or the background issues so that it's more efficient and hopefully less costly um, because the fees are still too high. Um, I want to be able to defend myself. Um, concealed carry weapon holders are not overall the perpetrators of gun violence. We're there to defend ourselves from violence. Um, I am becoming more and more physically vulnerable and I want to be able to um, protect myself. But those fees are really high. <coughs> So taking a gun safety class, being familiar with the safe storage, the safe carrying, the safe use, that's part of the process and I completely understand that. I am not going to be a grocery store risk. So we need to get away from some of the, um, I don't know, just the big broad sweeping things that people with guns are bad. Good people with guns are not bad. Bad people with guns don't have permits. They use stolen weapons. They use, um, they get them all over the place, but they are not the people that are going to be applying for this. And so the fees don't matter to them. It matters to me. So I'm just asking if there's something else you can do. Um, taking off the, the psychological evaluation Taking off some of those fees, cutting them is a very good start. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy Kokosek, 2242 Third Street. Actually, the first comments I have to read are not my own. There's somebody who could not be here. And I don't know his address, but he lives in Laverne. I can tell you for sure you all know him. Jeff Basler. Um, good evening, Council. At the last meeting, I expressed my support of Laverne offering concealed carry permits and encouraged keeping the cost of doing so as low as possible. During the public comment section of the meeting, oh, of the meeting, sorry. Unfortunately, I was unable to return from Las Vegas today to speak directly on the CCW item in the agenda as I had planned. That is why I've asked Kathy to read this 
to you on my behalf. Since the last meeting, I was thinking about the process and the itemized expenses to get the CCW that were posted in the article I read in the Daily Bulletin. In doing so, I came to the realization that there are potential redundancies that could be waived on an individual basis that would reduce the net price. For instance, if someone had a CCW in another state, it would mean that they have already undergone the necessary steps of the class and the site review, so those requirements could be waived. If someone has a commercial driver's license with a hazmat endorsement, then they have already gone through the Haz Prints live scan and further they have been approved by the federal government to drive 18 wheel bombs through cities. The federal evaluation would be more thorough than my CCW's check, making it unnecessarily redundant. There are many other potential redundancies that Laverne can identify and recognize along these lines. I strongly encourage the council to evaluate and consider such options to waive the elements of the CCW permit process where redundancies can be identified to lower the individual cost of obtaining the permit, which secures a constitutional right. And that's from Jeff Basler. Oh, it's 1834 Essex Avenue. And then I just want to speak for me quickly. I do want to thank the council and the police department and the city staff for revisiting the issue and for working to compromise on the fees. My only concern is the discretionary psychological assessment. I'm wondering, could this open up a can of worms? Say, um, you know, the chief is tasked with this to say, oh, there's a red flag, and then somebody brings a lawsuit against the city because they said, oh, well, he or she just didn't like me, or they were discriminating me because of my race, or, you know, something else. So could that cause a problem and trigger um, litigation? Um, you know, could we be sued for discrimination? Um, I really think the best option is to require the site for everybody. Um, what happens if we issue a CCW and a person uses it inappropriately and a deep pockets lawsuit is, is triggered? Um, are we covered by insurance or are we on our own? You know, I'm thinking of this all from a risk management um, standpoint. And then I guess, I mean, because I think that the more thoroughly we vet people, the better protected we are from those kind of lawsuits. And then my other thing is, what do the police department think? Do they prefer the psychological evaluations? And I mean, if really they think, yeah, I think this is a good idea, maybe we can subsidize some of that because maybe it's just too important to let go. So that's it, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Again, if you could state your name and your address. Yeah, please. hey there. I'm Erin Duffy. I live uh, at 2988 Butterfield Avenue in Laverne. Uh, thanks for your time tonight. And uh, I, I really um, appreciated the initial resolution that the council approved unanimously just a few weeks ago. Um, and I can understand the need to reduce fees and the concerns about that. But I really take issue with the um, the removal of the psychological background checks as a universal precaution. Um, you know, I think, I think it's one thing to, you know, go to the desert and target shoot, and it's a whole other thing to be carrying a, a firearm at the ready in your purse. It's a big responsibility, um, and to, to take on that responsibility, I think a one-time psychological exam is not too much of a burden. Um, but when it comes to the, um, and, and on that point too, I think giving the, the police as much information as we can when they're approving these um, permits is, is helpful to them and lets them do their job in, in an easier way and in a more uniform way. And um, if we do make it optional and at the discretion of uh, the police uh, in terms of who gets a, a psychological exam and who doesn't, I think it could be perceived that there's bias or an arbitrariness in who's being subjected to that additional level of uh, scrutiny and that additional fee. Um, and it, so it seems like a fairness issue really to just apply it uniformly to everyone. Um, but I, I hear my fellow citizens really concerned about fees, and I have a lot of empathy for this concern that, um, you know, for some people $1,000 is no big deal, and for other, pe other people it's a huge barrier. Um, and I wonder if there's some creativity that we could institute here with a sliding scale fee, where we could have a means tested fee schedule, and lower income folks could pay a lower fee or no fee, and higher income folks could pay a higher fee. 
Um, and it, it could be structured in a way that we would assume it would be cost neutral to the program over at, at large. So we're estimating, you know, what's the income background of folks that are applying, um, and we're asking for a cost subsidy among applicants. Or it could be that the city looks into its general funds and says we're going to subsidize the applications of low-income residents of the city because we don't want this to be um, a discriminatory approach based on income. And so I, I just wonder if there can be some creativity and flexibility in the way that we approach the fee schedule. So we're covering the administrative costs, but we're not presenting um, you know, costs as a barrier to access to a permit for someone who can meet the background requirements, is trained, is prepared, and wants to carry. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Duffy. Mr. Galvin. Joe Gallagher, supervised tonight, Amber. Um, I, I'm probably going to be on both sides of people I know and don't know on the issue, and I'm not afraid to say it. Um, I kind of think that the, the necessity for the um, uh, background check and psycholo psychological exam are worth asking for. Um, I don't aspire to, to get a concealed care permit. My wife does. We're both highly educated, highly accomplished. Um, I think we've done well in the community, been a scoutmaster, but I don't camp out to boys without any protection other than myself and my brain. So I can see how there's, there's concern for those who want to carry it. That said, I think we can narrow this down other than trying to be divisive and pit people and their ideology or their appreciation for the facts and not the, you know, um, the underlying emotional component to this by simply saying if it's important enough for us to be safe in our community and to have citizens in the community that desire to have this concealed carry permit and the responsibility that it carries, which is significant. Um, I mean, it's, they're, they're the bar. These are the people that they take the training, they have the weapons already, they're good individuals that are willing to step up, put their name on the list, be in public in this audience to tell you that they're, that they're here, they want to do the right thing. The fees, if it's that big of a deal for the math we're talking about, why doesn't cities just step, step up for its entire community and say, hey, if you want it, we're going to pay for the psych exam because it's that important to everybody. And get that out of the way and make it a non-issue. I don't think Sam and the rest of the police department are more concerned about a concealed carry permit owner when they pull somebody over than somebody who doesn't care about the law. So I really think that we need to differentiate between people in our, in our community that want something that is a service, okay, it's a service that the city provides at a lot of different levels for a lot of different things, versus trying to separate them by some line that says good people, bad people, people that are more tending to do this versus that. So for me, I think the city wants to do the right thing, pay the 50 grand, make this go away, make people in the community feel safe, and everybody gets a psych test, and if they fail it, they get a chance at another one. And also that psych test, you guys should consider what are, what are the conditions under which somebody says no and yes, and where, what rabbit hole that takes us down. So um, that's my opinion. Thank you. for an opportunity to talk to you. My name is Lawrence Blanchard, uh, 4748 Delmarsh Circle in Laverne. Just a few comments here. Um, first has to do with all of sort of the emotional statistics that's been presented. Uh, and I understand that. But I would like to you know, uh, present something on the other side of the issue in terms of firearms in the United States. Largest, most comprehensive survey of American gun owners ever conducted suggests that they use firearms for self-defense about 1.7 million times per year. So there's a very significant use of firearms on the good side as opposed to evil. Uh, and it's used very often to head off some very bad situations and to protect people uh, from some very dangerous things that could happen to them. So there's that. The other statistic I would like to cite to you is that concealed carry holders uh, commit less crimes than sworn officers of the police departments. Uh, that's a statistic that has stood up over time. 
that when they survey the amount of crimes committed by police officers, and I respect police officers very much, but uh, on their personal lives, police officers commit more crimes than concealed carry permit holders. So the whole notion that concealed carry permit holders are going to be criminals, are going to be out there uh, doing uh, crazy things with guns is just um, balderdash. It's not, not true. Uh, the other thing that I would like to comment on is this whole thing on the psychological evaluation. Um, this has all been presented as a matter of personal opinion. Well, the Bruin ruling says otherwise. You're not allowed to put in place a, a subjective standard in determining whether somebody gets a concealed carry permit. So this subject, subjective standard is somebody making a personal opinion about you as to whether you should be permitted to have a gun or not. Um, what was set in the Bruin ruling is a objective standard. In other words, they're allowed to do a criminal background check on you. If they're going to do a psychological test, it has to be an objective test in the sense of checking if you've had any uh, contact with the mental health authorities and that kind of thing. And then that would be an objective way of looking at if you have an issue. Uh, a subjective standard is if you have a psychologist who is deciding whether you're crazy or not or whether you're uh, allowed to carry a weapon. Uh, that gets into the subjective standard of what's my standard and why do I allow it and why I don't allow it. And the Supreme Court said that's not permitted. Uh, that's what the Bruin ruling was all about. Uh, in the state of New York, they were basically saying, uh, well, we're going to decide whether your reason for wanting to carry a gun is reasonable or not. And they basically said no to everybody, just like happened here in L.A. County. You have 11 million people in L.A. County. They only issued 135 permits because they said, you don't need it, you don't deserve it. So that's the subjective standard that was applied. So it's not about people's personal opinions or anything. What the Supreme Court says is it has to be uh, an objective standard of measure. One last thing I would like to say is uh, regarding the uh, permit <coughs> structure. If you look at the MyCCW fees, um, now I believe those are redundant. Because if we get down to where we're just really looking at, uh, we're looking at making the application, right? We're looking at the state doing the live scan, which will do the criminal background check, it'll do the mental health background check uh, at, at a more deep level. And then um, you're looking at um, a, um, a us paying for having a, uh, you know, a, a, a class uh, that we have to take uh, eight or 16 hours, depending on what eventually is going to happen here. But then you have to, you know, qualify with your firearm as well on a range. Uh, but all of that is out of the hands of the police department. All they have to do is gather that together and make a decision. So I think the, the my CCW thing can be completely eliminated because we're just looking at basically a background check that the state does, well, they take the app, background check that the state does, and then the class that we have to submit the documentation on. So I think that by reducing these requirements, then it gets down to the brass tacks of, I think they can get rid of my CCW. Anyway, sorry to take so much time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. My name is Harry Hawkins at 2039 Maverick Circle, Laverne. This is a very heated discussion, and I understand. I just got my CCW through the sheriff. Okay, The fees were a whole different range. Okay, Last time I looked, the county has jurisdiction in stuff like this over the city of Laverne. Okay. I would have loved to have gone to the city of Laverne, but I was directed through the NRA to go to my sheriff. Okay, so that's what I did. When I heard about these fees on our neighborhood site, I was appalled. I consider myself relatively sane, just coming up here. <laughs> but in, in six months, a year, two years, a tragedy happens, something happens, I could lose my mental health. That's why it, the, the permits are only two years long. You know, and you have to go in for an interview. And the training was 
16 hours long, not including range time. So the training is not a light training. It is not as good as a police officer, but it is, in my opinion, sufficient that I can handle a firearm, I can protect my family, and if need be, protect my neighbors in the event the police can't help us. I re respect and appreciate the Laverne PD. We're in one of the safest towns in the state of California. I'd like to keep it that way. <coughs> Thank you for, my, for listening to me. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Mayor Hepburn, City Council. Uh, my name is Isabel, and this is my very first Laverne City Council meeting. Uh, I came today because this is a topic that's important to me. Um, I'm concerned about the concealed carry weapon process because I'm a parent of three young kids uh, who go to preschool here in Laverne. I have a three-year-old and two four-year-olds. Uh, I'm also a licensed clinical social worker uh, here in the state of California. So first, I'd like to applaud the city on their efforts, the city and staff, for uh, reducing the proposed fees for the CCW permit. And I'd also like to point out that um, at your February 21st meeting, uh, the council already voted to require the psychological evaluations for all CCW permit applications. And I believe this was the right decision. I would like to implore this council to please retain the psychological evaluations as part of the pr permit process. Um, as I'm sure you all know by now, firearms are the leasing, leading cause of death among America's youth. And this is not just due to school shootings, this is due to increasing access to guns in our homes and in our communities. Uh, and these deaths are entirely preventable. During my social work training, I worked in an adolescent health clinic that implemented the best practice of conducting mental health screenings in addition to providing primary care. And such screenings complemented the medical care that our patients received. Um, and sometimes we caught mental health symptoms that may have been overlooked by the doctors, nurses, and other medical personnel that were treating our patients. Um, this was just part of the teamwork that we did. There were mental health professionals and medical professionals on the team taking care of our people. And so a standardized objective psychological assessment or screening should not be viewed as stigmatizing or limiting, uh, but rather a tool for keeping folks healthy and safe here in our communities. By eliminating the psychological screenings from the CCW permit process, we increase the chances that a concealed carry weapon ends up in the hands of someone who is not well or who is not responsibly able to carry a gun in public. Uh, by eliminating the psychological screenings, we increase the chances that Laverne Grow uh, adds uh, to the growing list of cities that's been marked by tragedies. We just don't want that here. Uh, the city of Laverne has an opportunity to proactively keep our community safer by implementing a psychological screening process for the CCW uh, permit application process. So why not? I mean, in fact, you've already voted to approve it back in February. So I ask that you please not backpedal on that, whether um, you're reconsidering because of costs or political pressure. I think the safety of our community is worth the um, added costs. So let's keep our children, please keep my children safe who go to school here in Laverne, keep our families, our neighbors, our law enforcement, our first responders safe, and let's uh, get this right and retain the psychological evaluations in this resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone <laughs> else wish to speak on this item? Uh, good evening again, uh, Mayor and City Council. Thank you for taking me again on this very important issue. Um, you know, I, I, I want to, before I uh, start, just kind of highlight how much and how universally the people of Laverne care about the safety and security of minority, poor, marginalized people, um, and ask the Council to keep this in mind as we are considering other things uh, in this city. Uh, with regard to the actual psychological examination, I just have some questions, and um, I think they align with uh, some of the previous speakers, but 
I would like to know which, what criteria will the chief use to determine whether or not a psychological evaluation is necessary. I think this is a standard that should exist if we're going to vote to have this be uh, the process. I would like to know how we're going to ensure that the chief is always following this standard and if the criteria itself is going to be published. Um, if it is published, I want to know if this is going to impact the integrity of the process. And if it is not published, then how does the citizenry retain its ability to maintain transparency in the process? How will the city ensure transparency in the process of selecting and referring individuals to psychological evaluation? Uh, I think that a blanket approach uh, will basically alleviate the city from issues of uh, alleged discrimination, uh, which I think would just expose the city to greater litigation, which is what I understand is what's making this uh, a complicated issue. I think Sam Gonzalez is great. I look forward to calling him full chief without the acting qualifier one day. Uh, but we don't know what the future is in store. We don't know who's going to be chief in the, down the line. And I think it requires having a systematic protocol that means we're able to maintain the integrity and transparency in the system. I also understand that the police were initially for psych evaluations. Uh, I would like to understand this, the change. Uh, if it is only fee-based, then I agree, shocker, with Mr. Gabaldon. I believe that the city should actually absorb the cost of all psychological evaluations if the police's uh, change in position is simply because of the cost. Um, lastly, I understand that a significant concern is potential litigation. And I've seen the city council tell more than enough lawyers to go pound sand for things like smelling and, you know, uh, quality of life issues. I think this might be one of the times where the city uh, could, could take a stand. And if litigation is ever appropriate, I think this is an issue that litigation is appropriate for. But if California is also going to create a standard, then I think let's leave it to the state to litigate this issue. And we need not even uh, get involved in this uh, at fear of creating more harm than good on this particular issue. Um, so I'm hoping to get some response to those questions. Uh, I do agree with the Bruin standard that uh, the psychological examination should be objective. I think psychologists can be discriminatory too. Uh, so a, a strictly objective system that makes sure that we're doing this the safest way possible is what I'm advocating for. Thanks, Council. City Council. Um, I know you all have a tough job. Oh, sorry, Stephen Ward, 4760 Calle Estrada. Um, thank you all for listening. I know this is a long meeting and you got a tough job where you're bound to make some people disappointed. Um, but six weeks ago, the police department came and presented to you and you voted unanimously uh, on the fee structure and the requirements, including a psychological evaluation. Unanimously. Uh, and since then, Nothing has changed in six weeks uh, other than some public pushback and a threat of litigation. I'm sure your city attorney has already told you, you're able to cost recover for the fees involved here. Um, ICCW was cheaper than doing this in-house. Uh, doing the live scan, the weapons training, all those charges that don't go to the city are required under state law. So while I recognize the impulse to respond to the good faith concerns of those who have issues with the cost, uh, the fees are justifiable and they're defensible. And while I don't want to see the city dragged into litigation over somebody saving a few hundred bucks on this application, it is a defensible fee. And so I, I do want to start with that. Um, but if you want to avoid that, if you want to be responsive and say, let's incur some of the costs, let's lower artificially the fees and eat some more of the costs, to satisfy the, the good faith concerns of a lot of responsible gun owners in this room and some gun owners on the, on the dais. I respect that and I understand that. But I don't think the place to cut costs is by eliminating the requirement for the psychological evaluation. 
six weeks ago when this first came up, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Crosby said the psychological evaluation was needed. And Mayor Hepburn, you agreed. You said it was extremely important. The Laverne Police Department, I pulled this from their website today, they said that the psychological, uh, the detailed assessment that the psychological assessment provides is very important for the police chief as it assists with making an informed decision when issuing a CCW permit. They mentioned that the exam that is provided uh, is used by mental health professionals to assess and diagnose mental illnesses such as depression, anxiety, antisocial, or psychotic behaviors. This morning I spoke to one of the licensed clinical forensic psychologists from the counseling team, the vendor that Laverne PD associates with. And she's an expert in threat assessments. And she told me uh, that the exam can flag things such as folks that have problems with emotional regulation, anger management, paranoia, psychosis, and other antisocial behaviors. These are the folks that we don't want to be carrying a weapon at all times. Now, I understand that a psychological evaluation is not required to obtain a firearm. And it's not going to stop, a, a CCW permit requirement is not going to stop every person who has ill intent or who is unwell from committing an act of gun violence. But statistics are clear, looser carry laws lead to increases in gun violence. Because we have folks that might not be mentally or emotionally stable enough to carry the enormous responsibility of carrying a weapon with them at all times. And the likelihood of a routine dispute turning into a shootout in a bar, in a grocery store, on the road, increases dramatically. The cost currently is capped at $150 that the applicant can pay. SB2 might lift that cap altogether so the city doesn't have to subsidize it. But I echo others, if you want to subsidize something, instead of subsidizing the administrative cost, subsidize the cost of the psychological evaluation. Subsidize keeping the city safe. Because as the Laverne Police Department said, it's very important. Mayor Hepburn, you said it was extremely important. Mayor Crosby, you said, Mayor Pro Tem Crosby, you said it was needed. Less than six weeks ago, I ask that you not back off of these positions. Your city attorney has told you you have the ability to require this, this common sense step in the process. And so I ask that you, each and every one of you who have campaigned on and spoken about the importance of public safety, take a stand today and keep the psychological requirement, psychological assessment requirement, and stand up for the public safety of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Mr. Mayor, Council, Rick Bowen. <clears throat> I'll make this quick. Um, first speaker tonight, AQMD, says, we have lots of money. Come down, buy something. We'll rebate you $250 if you buy a damn lawnmower. There's money available. We're not kidding anybody. The state has, you want to subsidize something? Subsidize <coughs> of this instead of buying a damn lawnmower, my opinion. <laughs> Um, number two, I may be one of the few people in this room that actually did have a gun to put, put to my head. And it, tonight it reminded me, 30 years ago about, I walked into an armed robbery. To, to this night, I never ever blamed the gun. I blamed the jackass that was there robbing the store and took me and a other bunch of people hostage. Obviously, nothing happened, but never blamed the gun. I blamed the guy that was a criminal that was robbing the store. And last thing I'd like to say is, you know, I've heard a lot of stuff tonight. A week ago today, a mentally ill person that was allowed to buy, I think they last count was seven guns. Her parents said she was mentally ill, walked into a Christian school, killed three nine-year-old children, 
and three adults tried to protect those children. So if anything, I hope to God we remember those three kids particularly on tonight's evening. Thank you. Thank you. separates things and expounds things and qualifies things. Mm -hmm. A well-regulated militia of comma What's that? Mike in your mouth? being necessary to the security of a free state, comma. Mr. Prentice, can you pull that mic a little closer to you? I'm sorry? Something yeah. you're saying good? Yeah, I'm <laughs> Thank sorry. you. Okay. <laughs> a well-regulated militia of comma being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. It doesn't say you have to be a part of a militia. It just says that a militia is important, and it, it separates that and says it's necessary. Then it goes on to say that the right of the people to keep and bear arms, and none of these rights should be infringed. And as I spoke with uh, Mayor Pro Tandy Crosby at the last meeting, I mentioned that I thought the cost we're quite high. And high cost that keep people from being able to, from economically deprived people, from being able to get a permit is an infringement. But I disagree with the, the, the part about that a psychological evaluation is not important. People who carry guns, mostly police officers, they go through extensive psychological <coughs> tests before they were hired. If there are problems during their professional careers, they go through psychological testing. When they when they reti when they retire, if they've kept up with the firearms training and standards, they can apply for a CCW certification. Except if they retire for psychological reasons they're in, in, ineligible for a CCW permit. I think that's important. And uh, the, the, the problem is, is that if we don't have a psychological testing, there's no screening there. You have one person <coughs> on a given day making a decision without having the necessary information. We don't need Rambos either in uniform or out of uniform, running around waving guns at people. So I think psychological testing is very important. Um, I know there's been comments made about um, that, that, that you can't have other subjective standards to that. But, I know that in, in 20, 000, 2022, Supreme Court ruled against the city of New York City. And they said they could not have the proper need to, have to, sit, uh, to issue a permit for carrying, carrying a gun outside the home. And so it wasn't about concealed weapons. This is about carrying a gun outside the home. And they said that there should be no, there should be no restrictions on someone carrying a gun outside the home. Now we have 26 states, and I understand maybe, maybe 28 states, that are what they call constitutional carry. That means there's no provisions there. There's no psychological testing. There's none of that. And it, when people talk about gun deaths, people who have CCW permits are seldom ever involved in illegal shootings. In fact, every week, if you read, if you follow the news, often, several times a week, you will, read, you will hear or read that a person who has a CCW saved people's life from an active shooter. It was in a liquor, liquor store or grocery store 
or you know, just in a neighborhood, people are protecting their house. And uh, so I, I, I just, I, I think that, that the psychological testing is very important. And if we, we want to lower the cost on it, we do, I think we ought to do it with administrative fees and, the, and, and all the rest of that kind of stuff. But the psychological testing and firearms training, knowing when to shoot, under what conditions they, they are allowed to shoot, and when they cannot shoot, and what is in the background of where they're, we're going to fire that firearm. That, those are the important things. And another thing is if someone's thinking about getting a CCW permit, it's more than just carrying a gun on your hip or you know, shoulder holster. There's a lot of liability goes with that. And you need to have a, have a safe in your house where you can keep the gun safe. When you travel, you should have one in your car. Uh, last, in this past year, I visited my grandson who was up in, in Northern California. He's, he's an executive with a school district up there. And he was taking around showing the schools. Well, I'm glad I had my, my, my driving gun safe in my car because, I mean, I, unlikely if I went on campus with, with carrying a gun that I would have been arrested. But I put it in the safe and locked it out so there was be no question of that. So there's, and anybody get CDW permit? Get insurance to cover you in those instances. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have one person on the call. Anybody else wish to speak on this item before we go to the caller? Hi, Council. This is Brittany Allison. Um, I am calling, and I wish I emailed each of you back in February, because I was so proud to come from Laverne. I was proud. I'm also proud of your willingness to reconsider costs and going back to the drawing board of finding ways to ensure equitable access. I'm so happy about how many callers have come in that also care about equity in our community. Um, but I just, I can't.
having the responsibility of my family's safety means that I believe every fiber that we add to the safety net that keeps our community safe is worth it. Um, no constitutional right, including your right to bear arms, is absolute. So having costs, fees, trainings, and evaluations that ensure that the individuals who are entrusted with this responsibility are absolutely safe and trained is a way of balancing the right to bear arms with the community's right to life. Um, we know that crimes of passion and impulsive assaults and even suicides are absolutely a thing. And there are studies that have been shown, statistics that have been brought up, um, in my research, I found just back in September, John Hopkins School of Public Health found that the average rates of assaults with firearms increased an average of 9.5% relative to forecasted trends after 34 states relaxed restrictions. What this meant is when states relaxed restrictions on civilians carrying concealed firearms in public, they saw an increase in um, the average rate of assaults with firearms. And so this is something that needs to get taken into consideration. Um, I, I think that we need to add this layer of uh, safety to this process. And I'm really happy to hear it sounds like most callers agree. Thanks so much. Thank you, Brittany. <laughs> Any other speakers on this item? Robin Carter. Oh, no, 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 I'm leaving. <laughs> 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 I have to do this before, but I get to leave. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Um, I was not expecting to speak tonight. My name is Morgan Kostolewski, and I'm a registered nurse in the community. We have heard a lot of opinions this evening, and I can respect all of them. Um, working in the area of science, I really like to see objective information, not necessarily subjective information. And we've heard all about the psych exams, whether I think it's correct or not, which I do not think it's correct, and I respect the chief's decision to base this on information that comes from the background checks and criminal records. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the renewal process because we haven't heard from anybody that explains what my CCW is doing um, on the online end. Um, it's been pretty simple. Sergeant Linerud has been great and responsive in helping with that. But I think when it comes to renewal time, it will be very redundant. And that is one thing that we can do to lower fees. I'm willing to pay the money to get this all done. Um, I'm a, resp a responsible firearm owner myself. And I like that. You know, you have to jump through a few hoops, that's okay, but with the Bruin decision, I think it takes away a lot of the guessing game out of this. Um, so I'd like to look at what the renewal process will look like in the next two years when all of us have kind of gone through the initial process. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Seeing others, we're going to close public comment. Bring to the day as uh, chief. Did you want to? There was a couple, two or three questions. Yes, yeah, sorry, I got excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of them was a liability issue. What the person carries, if the city, if the issue will come in, I think was one of the big questions was what kind of liability do we have as an entity for the CCW permit holder if there's an issue that arises? Uh, as you heard from some of the uh, speakers uh, this evening, is that. Uh, they suggest you buy insurance. Um, and one of the things that uh, is recommended is that you buy insurance. Uh, your decision to conceal carry comes with great responsibility, just like a police officer. Your decision to pull the weapon and discharge it, uh, the liability is in your hands. Um, but the way the mayor asked was the liability is not on the city. city, it's on the person. Yeah, understanding that with an individual who gets a CCW and gets goes through the clearing and gets the permit to carry. Um, if if through uh, if we do our own background checks as far as psychological testing and there's an issue with that person that got the CCW and there is an action that they take that's a heinous action, are we responsible as a city that allowed them with the psychological backing of are we liable for that situation as far as a lawsuit? Perhaps, uh, Mr. Mayor, I can address that. Would that would be wonderful. Question of law. Thank you. Um, the, 
uh, first of all, nothing ever present, prevents the city from getting sued. Right. Um, <laughs> certainly, the city is more likely to get sued if uh, if they if they did issue a CCW permit to someone who then you know used that permit or is carrying uh, concealed <coughs> and uh, caused injury to someone else. What um, I think the only the real risk for the city is if we fail to pay attention to whatever information we get back from the Department of Justice, uh, from a licensed psychologist, if that is required, um, if we don't do the proper searches and, and so on, if we don't have a good background check, then I think the city could potentially face liability by issuing a CCW to someone who should not have received one. But generally speaking, the city would not be liable for uh, an injury caused by a CCW carrier if they were properly issued a license. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Silver. Uh, this is actually a question that uh, was presented to Ms. Silver during the process as well. Uh, to move on to uh, Mr. Allison's questions, I appreciate the, the concerns and the comments. I believe his first question was, uh, what is the Chief's criteria for recommending a psychological? Um, that I'm going to keep close to my pocket. It's like kind of giving the answers to the test the way. Someone comes to take an examination, they already have the answers pre-designated. Um, the, department the department's stance as far as the psychological is concerned is, is, is as I mentioned um, in my presentation, <coughs> that we require uh, to have psychological exams to provide uh, the police chief, either myself in an acting capacity or when Colleen returns, uh, uh, the best information in the best interest of the public. That, that is the that uh, We were asked to uh, completely look at the, at, at the entire process and where we can uh, ensure we were still uh, obtaining the best information to achieve that goal that's in the best interest of the department. Um, it's truly a needle in a haystack. Um, yeah, but that's a determination that, that, that before you today. Um, uh, what was his, uh, his second question? Was uh, requiring psychological exams, and if if we leave it to the chief uh, as a discretion, uh, would not be subject to uh, the lawsuits uh, again? Uh, Ms. Barlow uh, stated perfectly that. Uh, in the 25 plus years I've been doing this job, uh, if I worried about being sued, I wouldn't be able to do my job. Uh, again, we're looking to uh, obtain the best information to make the best decision for for everybody, not for a select few. Uh, either side of the, of the aisle, uh, we're looking to make the best decision as possible. Thank you. Anything else? Can I just um, ask for clarification because I want to make sure that I'm understanding um, correctly. Um, I know you don't want to give away the answers to the test. I think the question really, if I'm understanding what Mr. Allison was saying correctly, is that is the chief or whoever is acting in her stead making a decision for administering or the need to administer a psychological exam based on independent information received or is it a subjective, hey, you look sketchy to me, Right. Um, so, so that I think that's the question. The, the question between objectivity and subjectivity. So, if it is going to be a discretionary requirement in terms of um, who needs to have a psychological exam, on what basis, on what objective basis, is that determined? Uh, that is based on the information obtained in the psychological. Um, I'm as sorry, I, obtained in the in the psychological in the background to to have a psychological performance. And then just to further clarify, because I think someone else had mentioned that under the um, background check that there was um, letters of recommendation or something to that effect, and that's not the case. It's references as in any background check that would be conducted, there are references asked for that are included within the scope of that background. Is that correct? That is correct. No. Thank you. I'm just... Um, we asked the police chief, the interim, the acting police chief, Gonzalez, to go back because we had such reverberation over the amount that these fees were. And we decided it was a good idea to maybe go back and revisit it to see if there was some way that they could reduce the costs. But I think here we're going to be faced with the challenge of 
I think the most important thing is the safety of our children, the safety of our residents, and the safety of our employees when we make these decisions. So uh, understanding that we would like to make the fees free, but unfortunately at this point you can't do that. Uh, we are faced with many other things in our city that cost. We have employees. We are already in this, this current fee structure, not the new fee structure, but the current fee structure we're going to be um, we're going to be uh, $15,000, is that or $15,000 of cost to the city, is that correct? With this new fee, we will be absorbing $15,000 worth of cost, is that correct? Is that correct? The, if you're equating that to the amount of uh, subsidies that we're yes. using yes. for the psychological? No, no, forget the psychological, but the, uh, the one that we're proposing now for the, uh, the $786. That are we still um, utilizing fifteen thousand dollars of city funds to subsidize it as it currently is? So when we talk about this subsidies uh, performing the actual uh, exams, um, we are going to be uh, we have adjusted those amounts so that uh, we can make it more palatable. Uh, but it'd be fifteen thousand dollars. I'd have to double check the math. Uh, but I think that's what it saved last that, time. That, we're that, we're that, actually that, are subsidizing already with our uh, current fee structure. That is that correct. That? Yes, correct. Okay. So the decision has to be made basically on this is the safety of the overall residents and understanding that we are doing this and that S SB2 um, may change the complexity of this completely within the next year or less. Um, and so, comments. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Crosby. Thank you so much. Um, the question came up um, a lot uh, this past week was why? Why are we coming back and visiting this? And um, I want to make sure that you uh, you know that were my reasons why. Um, after um, our decision uh, six weeks ago, um, the, the information that was given to us, we had some comparable cities, and the comparable cities were um, just like cities like ours, and they weren't all the cities around us. As you saw the chief put up all the cities around us, we got that information afterwards. And that really changed uh, and made me really look at um, our residents. Um, are our residents being treated the same as other people that are coming through our city every day and around? And I want to make sure that our residents are, are kept. Um, I really do appreciate everyone coming up and speaking tonight. We had um, over 26 people come up and speaking on this item and really do appreciate that. I appreciate the, the quorum of the people speaking on both sides of the issue. Um, I want to make sure that I did say um, six weeks ago that um, the psychological test, I believe that was needed. Um, I want to make sure, though, and verify that as well, though, um, I believe um, in our new proposal, um, because I was working with and speaking with the chief about our new proposal and really heard about our residents and what psychological tests um, do and really learned about it, was that if we feel it's necessary, then they should have that. I'm, I am for the uh, first proposal that uh, uh, where if because of background check and because of the interview, then we need a psychological test, then that resident needs, needs to have one. Um, if we have 90% uh, of our residents that are, are, have no issues, have no problems, um, and they go through all that process, then maybe, then they shouldn't have to have that uh, piece be put on that. Um, and, the structures of the people that we really, really want to look at is through our objective view from our our uh, chief and through the process of the background check. Um, we this is a tough subject to have. I think um, I'm sorry I didn't get your name. Uh, he said it great last time, where uh, Jim Carlson. He said last time where. This is like a state issue and a country issue. We put on the state and put on our local, co our, our local uh, municipalities. And I really believe when we have um, these large issues, it really is a, we should all be the same as a state. SB2 is trying to work on that, but we don't know if that's going to ever pass. Nope. And we have to make sure that 
our city and our residents are taken care of. And the right for them to have that is, is in place as well. But I do agree that if we had one um, rule for the entire state, so that we know who's carrying, and they all go by the same rule, that would be much better than every city making different rules up. Um, so I really did appreciate uh, you saying that last time and saying that to us. Uh, and so those are my comments of why. Um, I might have, people believe I changed my mind or changed my view or why we're looking at this again um, is, is making sure that we have more information. Thank you, Mayor Crosby. <coughs> Council Member. So I just want to talk a little bit about, again, just a reminder about why we came back. And I want to assure the public um, that in the discussions about this particular issue, I think the other thing that you should be aware of is that I think we're learning as we go in terms of how certain things get uh, communicated out. Um, so I think that one of the takeaways for us was the next time that there is something that is going to be, um, I don't know, controversial or engender a lot of feedback, that we need to be more um, on the forefront of it and conduct something like a study session to elicit those comments before a proposal is put forth, voted on, and then everybody gets confused again when it gets brought back on the agenda. So that is our attestation to you that we are learning as we are going. And so we are trying to do the best that we can. I think in terms of this issue, and I think in terms of making a lot of the decisions that we have to make for this city on behalf of the citizenry, is that it is a constant balance. That it, it requires the thoughtfulness of all of you that are sticking with us 10 minutes to 10 o'clock tonight, um, who came out in February as well, who wrote, who called, who did all of those things. It is a constant balance of trying to balance the needs of the community with the needs of the individual and making sure that we are hopefully striking a place where, you know, in all my days as, a, as an attorney that mediated cases, nobody goes away happy. You know, that's the unfortunate truth, right, is that when you get to a place where nobody is happy, then you probably hit the right place. Um, and, you know, I think that in my conversations with acting chief and with some of the other police officers regarding the psychological evaluation, because I know that has been a, a huge um, point of contention, when we voted on this in February, I said yes to psych evals across the board. Um, and in trying to balance the idea of cost to individuals who wish to be able to carry and conceal and the needs of the community to have safety, then we had to evaluate, do I trust that what the information that is going to be provided to the chief or her, whoever is acting in her stead to make an objective decision about who must have a psychological evaluation, I had to feel comfortable in that. And knowing that this isn't going to be arbitrary, it isn't going to be based on, hey, I know you, you're my friend, I kind of like you, so, you know, you don't need to worry about a second health. That's not, you know, that's not how this is going down, right? And, you know, those of you that know me, I'm not looking for us to be in a situation where we have a, a school shooting or something god-awful happen where we have to have a candlelight vigil with thoughts and prayers that do absolutely nothing. Right? So I, I want you to know that you know, we are listening, we have been listening, and we are doing the best that we can to come to a reasoned conclusion. And so I, you know, I have to trust in what our subject matter experts are telling us in terms of what CC, my CCW will provide to the chief or whoever is acting in their set to make the correct decision with respect to who needs to perform a psyche valve. Um, I think it's also key to note that the point that the chief made earlier about the right to own a gun, the right to have a gun, is separate and distinct from a personal license to be able to carry the gun wherever you want. So that is the distinction. So that is, you know, I, I want people to be aware of that. You can, you're still allowed to have your gun. The question here is how do we balance the concerns of the community with the concerns of the individual who want to be able to be responsible. And I've talked to some of you who like Ms. Galvedon said, has been shooting since she was a small child. There are probably people that I would trust more than others based on the conversations that I've had with them and their knowledge around handling something that can kill someone, right? I didn't grow up in a household with guns, but I'm not here to take away your right to do that. That's how you grew up, if you hunt, if you do, whatever. But I do need to think about the community at large. So, I, like I said, I, I want you to know that this isn't something that we take lightly. We wouldn't be here this late at night. We wouldn't have had, you know, the endless conversations that we've had with residents. Um, and all I can promise from, you know, this point forward is on other issues of import, we are going to 
try to be more on the forefront of things rather than doing this. We vote once and then we come back and we vote again. So. Thank you, Council Morrell. Council Member Cash. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, rest of my team, Council Members here. We've had this issue that was brought up to us a while back, and you know I do agree. Uh, I, agree with, I agree with them. I agree with now. I'm just stuck in the chin and almost like a rock in a hard place. I am more than anybody else a patriot, and I never want to stink your right to carry your uh, firearm that many men and women in this country have fought for, right? So. What I was stuck in is like, how do I make it affordable? Business? I hate fees and I hate taxes. I'll probably get audited soon. But that's okay. It won't be the first time. Stay on target. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying. I really don't like it. I, I just can't stand it. You know, you got to charge a fee. No one's listening. I know. It's okay. We're like, it's okay. Plus, I, I want to make it affordable to you. One way for me that I thought was be able to is to remove that. But I don't want to remove that opportunity from the chief of police to make it affordable. Form decision. I've been in law enforcement long enough to know that we're always been told you carry multiple hats. You're a social worker, you're a doctor, you're, you're, a, uh, you're a police officer, you're, you're, you're just all these different functions. But it's hard because now you're faced with a decision to make to give you the opportunity to write. I understand, and, and uh, Councilmember Lau mentioned it. Uh, speaking with the acting chief. Sam is also I've known for many years when he actually had hair. That's not a story. It's okay, it's a great time too. Got a good man. Listen, it's a great opportunity to talk and have this. Uh, I was going to say. But let's give them an opportunity. Let's give them that opportunity to make that sort of form decision, right? Let's base that on uh, those that have experience in dealing with uh, mental health, okay? I you. Thank you, Councilmember Cash. I want to personally thank uh, Acting Chief Gonzalez, Acting Captain Grantsville, and uh, Sergeant Weinrock, also our city staff, Mr. Domer. As Councilmember Lau, they've all stated, um, this kind of came upon us. We had a chief of police that fell ill, and this was all part of this time frame when we probably would have had it out, we could have had it out with the public to go over this item. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. So moving forward. We're making sure that any big item on this, any items that need to be discussed, is discussed before the residents to make an informed decision for all of us. And we all do listen. We've had countless emails on this, countless. And I pride myself on reading all of them and responding to all of them. You may not like my response, but I do respond. Uh, and I honestly think right now the most important thing is to, um, I understand the CCW people's point of view, but I also understand the residents. I also understand the families with kids. A lot of stuff's going on in this country right now that's not good. So I think the most important thing right now is to be safe, cautious, protect our children, protect our residents, and also protect our employees. And I think that's the most important thing. Uh, cost, yes, it might be a little egregious. Uh, they did already drop it down uh, to uh, a much better level, but at the end of the day, we're not including the psychological exam. My personal opinion is I don't think that the chief of police should be doing psychological exams because that's not their forte. They've got plenty of other things to do. And $150 is a cheap price to pay for at least to bet it out properly. So the person that is getting that CCW is quantified and quantified to be able to have that. Not to say that it's not going to go wrong. There's always instances where it does go wrong. Um, but being that said, I would like to make an alternate motion. We have a motion on this right now for uh, an alternate motion to include the $150 and the $786 fee. Council, what can we do? There's no motion. There's no motion. This is just a just a, a recommendation. So, Mr. No. Mayor, Council, um, no if you approve the uh, the fee resolution, it'll amend the previous one. Right. It'll reduce the $150 administrative fee down to $100. It will. Um, Add the ten dollar um, change in amendment one. Uh, I'm understanding that. Yeah. I want what the new resolution is or the new uh, change is to add the hundred and fifty dollars onto that for the psychological exam because it was removed. So well that and again that's not a fee to the city, I understand that's a that. fee to a third party. I so understand. 
Um, if you just pass the resolution, then the psychological can stay. We would need direction to remove the psychological, because that's <coughs> part of the policy right now, is to require a psychological exam, which goes to a third party. So if you just pass the resolution, the psychological exam is still a requirement to go through the CCW permit process. But that's not part of the $786 right now. Um, no, that was mentioned in there as, but then there's the alternative that you saw, which was the 936, if my math is right. That's with the, that's with, one. Yeah. That's so, the one I'm, yes. So we, let that's, me try to see if I can clarify. clarify Are you please. asking yes. in an alternate resolution that everybody be required to have a psychological exam? Or are you, because right now the way I'm understanding it is that this, um, <coughs> new resolution in the 786 doesn't have it, doesn't have it unless it is and unless, unless the it is police chief is the only one that's going to do that is right. going to recommend a psychological exam at 150 dollars and i want to make sure that i'm not misunderstanding it is not just on the police chief to say that a psychological exam is needed it is based on the objective evidence produced through the background check by my CCW. So looking at the objective information obtained through the background check, there's going to be items in there, and like Acting Chief um, Gonzalez said, he's not gonna give away what those potential red flags might be as a cheat sheet, but if those exist, then the chief would say, you need to go get a psychological exam, which would not be conducted by the chief, but would be conducted by the partner, the <coughs> counseling team, so it would be done by a, by a psychologist, not by the chief. But the it's chief has the ultimate decision on that. So if we have everyone doing a psychological test as part of the $936, the chief does not have a say on that. That's it correct. is correct. already part of our CCW application. And okay. that's what I'm asking for. Okay, so, so, okay. okay. so, let, so let me clarify. The resolution changes... changes the fees that the city receives because our fee resolution only covers the fees that we charge not the outside vendors I fees. understand that so if you approve the resolution and direct us to continue with our existing policy that would mean everybody has the psych exam if you approve the resolution and direct us to uh, only have <coughs> psych exams at the, at the discretion of the police chief based upon the objective evidence. That's a different, but either way, the resolution reduces the fees. I, but on but page, it does not control the psych exam. I'm sorry, on page 133, it says reevaluation of permit fees, reduction of city administrative fee from 150 to 100, elimination of $20 CCW permit. Yes. And change the requirement of psychological testing and payment of 150. Firearm safety training vendors offer a reduced rate of 175. Yeah, that's in the staff report, but okay. the actual resolution provided to you does not address. Does not address the psychological. Issue. That's all I was saying. Yeah. So the recommendation was that you could choose one of those. Yeah, and again, the uh, the resolution is only because those are the fees we control. We do not control. The I fees. understand all that. What I'm saying is I want to have in the CCW a psychological exam is required, period. So the appropriate motion will be moved to approve the resolution, uh, and if you want us to read the title, uh, and to keep the existing uh, requirement for a psych exam. Exactly. So I need to, yes. So then I'm confused. And I'm not trying to be a pain in the ass, but I, I probably am going to be sure right now. Um, we want to make sure we're reporting on the right thing. Because the way I'm reading the staff report then says one thing, and the resolution says well, something and else. That's what and so that's, Crosby was saying. that's the concern I have, because the way that the staff report indicates, indicates as if the resolution was going to remove the need for a psych exam across the board and only allow psych exams at a discretionary level. So if you look at the resolution, then if the only thing that the resolution itself changes is our fees, then it Correct. contradicts. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the staff report was to provide um, options and information for all of those items. Um, the resolution is just for our fees because that's the only thing we control. And the staff report was written so that 
um, the council would understand what the cost could be if the psychological was taken out. Um, and then in the staff or in the uh, staff presentation, you also saw the cost if it were to stay in and be modified from the original 1,081, which was the higher admin fee, the um, card fee, and all that. So. Um, I'm going to read the last line of the psychological examinations on page 133. Accordingly, the need for a psychological assessment for applicants will remain discretionary as part of the permit process. Yes, no, it, and that is how it reads with the understanding that this was a fluid issue in the council based on public comment exactly. and yep. comment up to the time that this meeting was in session uh, could receive additional public input, um, make different decisions, but you would come here at this hearing, um, get additional information. And again, so that was the direction we were going based on the information and the public comment but knowing that this meeting would ultimately be the decision factor of the council providing direction to either stay with the psychological or get rid of the psychological exam, and then that's the fee that would be charged, and that was the recommendation kind of in the body of the staff report, but based on ultimately coming here and having the public comment. Okay, and, and I, I can be okay with that to some extent. But then that raises back to the question of then what is the appropriate motion? If the mayor is seeking to move forward a motion that amends the resolution, then it wouldn't be a motion to approve resolution number whatever no, number it is. You wouldn't need to amend the resolution um, unless you wanted to get rid of the admin fee all the way instead of reducing it from 150 to 100. Um, you would, the direction would be to uh, adopt the resolution, which again, it reduces the admin fee mm -hmm. from 150 to 100. To 100. It um, reduces the reduces, card replacement fee. Yeah, it doesn't uh, address the card replacement fee. Mm -hmm. And it corrects the renewal fee. Mm -hmm. But um, there would need to be separate uh, direction regardless about the psychological. So do we make it? not discretionary, but subject to the objective standards found through the background check, and then the chief of police could say, yes, uh, this applicant needs a psychological test, or is it blanket? As part of the CCW process, it is required for all applicants. Okay, so if we take it in pieces then, if we're okay with Just the reduction the of the administrative fee and the card replacement fee and correcting the renewal yeah. fee. We can we can deal with that right now and right. just vote. We can do yeah. that resolution now. Yeah, and then, then you could decide on how you want to do the psychological. So okay. that would probably be easier to do it piecemeal like that. We go through this. Okay. okay. We good? Yes. So we're going to stick with the resolution and then we're going to discuss afterwards Correct. on the fee or not the fee. Correct. Or psychological. Or, well, on, on a psychological on the examination requirement. requirement. <laughs> We'll need a motion for that, though, to put that in. Is that correct? Um, the initial one had it in there. Now we removed it on the new resolution. No, again, remember the, the, the initial, again, the initial was also just a fee resolution. The policy put forward by the police department was to have okay. a psychological I'm following you. Okay. So with that, we need a motion for this resolution. Do I have a motion? Yes. Yes. To make it crystal unclear, <laughs> is this, this motion again is not for or against the psychological, it's only for our fees right, right now. And then we will do a separate yes. motion yes. on yes. psychological. Correct. That makes sense. Motion to approve. <laughs> Second. All those votes, please. That was approved 4 0. Thank you. Now, I would like to make a motion. I would like to direct staff that the psychological $150 fee 
be permanent in or to be oh my gosh <laughs> do the hundred fifty dollar fee for the psychological everybody test of being part of it everybody does the psychological no, so, test. Yeah. so you're first here. I, I think what you're trying to say is and, and correct me if I'm wrong I think you're trying to say that you want to move a direct staff to change the policy or I guess maintain the policy <laughs> because which requires a psychological exam for, for all every applicants. Yeah. Yes, thank you. That's correct. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That's clear? That's clear. So we need to vote on that, is that correct? We should second. I'll second. All vote, please. Wait, wait, wait. We are voting for the psychological test, $150. To be clear. To be clear. The motion is to direct staff to maintain the existing policy to require all CCW applicants to have the psychological exam. That's clear. That's clear. So before we vote, I just want to make sure that we have the discussion before the vote. Because you've got your motion, you've got your second, so it's a live it's vote. It's, it's a live motion. Okay. So, Rick. Mayor Pro Tem Crosby. Um, as stated earlier tonight, um, I believe that um, through the process of our background checks, then um, our, our police department then can um, objectively view those who need the psychological test and those who um, do not require that, which would be a majority of, of the people. And um, I believe that people that come and get CCWs are our honest residents and our residents um, in Laverne um, that, uh, I believe that uh, we can objectively choose uh, for the psychological tests, and those that don't, don't have to be burdensome with, with that extra cost um, to our city and to the residents, because it's a double cost. It's not just a cost uh, 150 to the resident, it's, a, it's also a cost to um, our, our city as well, where the people just around us um, don't have that burden. And they're still in our cities and, and, and coming to our town. Um, and I believe in our Laverne PD and our residents to be treated as, as <coughs> others are treated in LA County or San Bernardino County that's right next to us or Riverside County that's only a, a, a stone throw away from us as well. So um, my vote will be for that. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Crosby. That's what we're allowed. I think, you know, I've made my, my points about this and I've taken into consideration the concerns and I think that based on what I was able to elicit from our chief and from our discussions is that I think the background check that my CCW is going to conduct will be thorough enough to indicate who will or won't need a psychological exam. And so I, you know, I think that's where I have to look at this too in terms of work when we're doing this you know, balancing act um, of of what we're you know of what the needs are um, of the community and of the individuals. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Cash. Thank you, Mayor. I share with the same sentiments. Um, you know, I just want to get this process up and moving so people can exercise their right to you want to carry a weapon. This is the standard. Uh, something that I will never change from the, you know from the standards. Of the so anyhow, good luck and. Thank you, Councilor Cash. Uh, we are Laverne. We are not Glendora. We're not Los Angeles County. We're not San Bernardino County. We are Laverne, and we have a higher standard, and that's why we keep our city safe. And I think this is just one more thing to keep ourselves safe, keep our children safe, our employees safe, and our residents safe. I firmly believe this $150 psychological exam testing is important. It takes the guesswork out of our chief of police and staff to do extra work <coughs> when we have them do that, give us the report, and we make our decision. And so, you want to talk again? I just have a question. Council Member Lapp. I'd like to hear, actually, from Acting Chief. I, I would like to know where your thoughts are on this. If, if this is going to make, you know, because I, I can see both sides, and I'm, I'm trying to be cognizant of this balance. 
Um, I think in a perfect world, if we have the coffers for it, I'm not against Mr. Galbadon's you know, um, recommendation that we just pay for it all. The problem is we don't have the money to pay for it all. But you know, I'd like to hear your point of view in terms of there's an, a universal requirement for uh, my opinion is that, that we allow the policy to stand as is and have a requirement. Okay, I'm sorry, I missed the first part. Can you uh, say that again? Yes, my, my recommendation is to uh, allow the policy to remain in place and have that requirement for all. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate the clarification on that. Thank you. I ask for a vote. Can, you, can we restate the motion so we're all clear on what we're voting on? Please. Yes, the motion is to direct staff to maintain the existing policy requiring all CCW applicants to um, have a psychological exam authorized by the state. I can't remember it now. Which way? Yes, if you want the side. Yes, right. Thank you. No, if you don't. I'll second. Okay, so we've got first and second. Okay, we're good. We're good. So, Crosby, you're voting. Ready? Oh, please. That motion carries three to one with Crosby dissenting. Thank you, everyone. Just to let you all know, this isn't my longest meeting. We've had plenty of long meetings. I can I can hang with the best of you, so I really do appreciate your time, all the emails, your comments. We still have public comments. We're not leaving yet. We still have public comment. Oh, yeah, we need a, like a three-minute break for some business to attend to. Mr. Johnson's asleep. Mr. Johnson must be asleep. So now they, uh, somebody alerted me that no, they've, they've scooted the test down to mid April. So I called them. Well, that's just for people who live far away. So they're walking or they're riding bikes. I mean, I don't, I'm going to go to San Bernardino. You know, so anyway, she gave me a corner or a consular and it's still like the 60s.
see a gentle, uh, gentle criticism. Excuse me. First of all, I had three points to, uh, that I want to talk about, but I've since amended those to four, and I'll explain that in a second. Mr. Mayor, previously you said that you were, and I'm paraphrasing here, that you said that if somebody had already voiced an opinion on a subject before the council, it did be repeating. I'd like to see that apply to this council, and I'm, get, I'm referencing what happened last council meeting. And that was uh, when you um, spent an awful lot of time appreciating City Finance Director Lopez. Uh, she was thanked for doing her job by at least three members of this council and Mr. Domer, too. Uh, the word appreciate was used at least 20, 20 to 25 times, although it seemed to be an awful lot more. That meeting could definitely have been shortened by a few minutes if the body had edited itself when it comes to thanking and appreciating city employees. That was my first point. Second point, I was going to say that this, this uh, body was being cowardly by not putting forward the CC w issue back on the agenda obviously my point is moot now so that's the end of that uh, the third item was speaking on a more positive note thank you mr mayor for the for the instagram post um, titled mail with the mayor i find them informative and a welcome source of city information and i really appreciate it okay my fourth was and this was added at the last minute because i uh, saw the City, news, city manager's newsletter come out right as I was leaving the house. And I noticed that there was no mention of the CCW issue as an, as a, an item for the city, city news. So I looked back at the last, all the way back to February, uh, to March, uh, excuse me, to January. And as far as I know, there was no mention of CCW. Plenty of fairs, plenty of egg hunts, plenty of team sports, all the good things. But an item that I think was important, and that's why I'm here, was a CCW item. And there was no mention of it. So I'm wondering, Mr. Domer, if you had some kind of prejudice against this issue, because it never showed up. I assume you were the editor of it. Uh, city city um, staff may write most of it, but I think you would probably, uh, should have the editing part um, as part of your duties. Um, so I just wanted to know if there was a prejudice against that, and if we're going to include all these other items within the city newsletter. Why was this left out? That's my say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gabaldon. I guess I'll start off with a, a bit of a funny. I was going to present on something else tonight, but I think given what we talked about, I'll save it for another meeting. Um, I think a couple things, um, I'm gonna start with uh, Council Member Lau. I appreciate what you said, because it's the first time I've actually heard anybody on the council say that in a way that I felt resonated with people. But it, it's what you said that was most important about if you had anticipated this issue and put it in front of the city in a more <laughs> public and transparent way to give everybody the opportunity to participate, I know that people can miss stuff, and you try sometimes to put things on the agenda, but really, it's on the, on the agenda at the last minute. And if you're not here that weekend to catch it and prepare, you're just not ready sometimes to show up. But I, I think that if the city took more time to anticipate these very hot-button issues in the community, a lot of the information and the redundancy of the thoughts and comments that has been mentioned, and I mentioned it too last time, would be avoided. Because I think trying to get people to get a constructive thought out to a productive end in three minutes is asinine. Okay? Because if everybody had the chance to sit in a room and hear somebody bring it up, they'd know it got brought up. And they would feel compelled to repeat themselves just to voice their opinion so that you knew that the community cared about the, the, the issue. So I really encourage you to look to do that more with the community because I think that's, that's actually an olive branch. Additionally, I think. Uh, my honest opinion, I think you missed the mark on this issue this evening from the standpoint of the root issue, which was cost. I don't agree that cost should have been an issue at any point on this. I know the city spends a lot of money on different things, and this was a choice you had to make. And this one, for whatever reason, was put upon the police department to try to cost account for their expenditures so that they're not putting the city in a deficit position. I think that was a, a, a misstep on your part. I think that you should put your city staff or the police department or the fire department in a position of trying to defend 
when it is obvious a necessity or a need, and then put it on the residents to fight back because they feel like it's coming out of their pockets again. We are taxpayers. We paid the price the first go round. We paid for everybody's salary on this, on this dais. We paid for the city attorney, the manager, everybody first. So when you make decisions about what we should pay for again, please consider our opinion in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Galvan. Very good. Ms. Bocan. First, I want to take a moment to thank Public Works. They came and finally, after seven years, came to trim the city tree on my property. Um, we were very concerned with the drought and the roots come to the surface and then all the rain we had and the ground is saturated. It was leaning towards my house, which is facing my parents' bedroom. I don't need that falling on their head. So thank you very much to whoever made that happen from the city. Um, Secondly, I'd like to ask why our flag was not at half mast for the shooting, the children that were shot and killed in the Nashville school shooting. That is a, a travesty. Anytime a child is killed anywhere in this country, our flag should reflect that in honor of those people who lost their lives. <clears throat> Third, I don't, um, I didn't get the presenter's name of the AQMD presentation. The mics weren't working. We, we, you know, Michael Cacciotti. Kind of, okay, thank you. Um, he made a comment that said, the federal government is not doing their job. So why should the burden be placed on the small city of Laverne? We are not a major manufacturing city that outputs massive amounts of smog from factories. And it's like the old days when you used to go to a restaurant and they would ask you, do you want smoking or non-smoking section? How does the smoke know to stay in that area? So Laverne's gonna spend $1.2 billion to accommodate AQMD in the state of California. And the smog is gonna come from La Puente, Azusa, and all these other areas that have major manufacturing and all of that smog will come and back up against the foothills here. Why, are, why is the city being forced to accommodate that? Um, and it, I think it just goes to show that the city continues to acquiesce the state and our uh, very closely dictator-like governor. We need to stop thinking about spending the money on types of projects that are only going to contribute to future problems. We're talking about going to electric. It has been determined by experts that our grid cannot sustain full electricity. We will force brownouts and blackouts. You're talking about switching over public work trucks. Well, then they're not going to be able to go take trees out of the way when they knock down because they can't be charged because there's no electricity for it. I'm talking about $17,000 per charging station downtown. I mean, these are things that are so far out of the realm of the state of California's capacity. I don't think you guys have really stopped to think about is it really that important? We need to wait to see what happens with our grid, if the infrastructure can sustain it, and if there's going to be any upgrades to it. Um, I recently saw a movie, uh, a documentary. It takes 18 months to build one transformer, and they're not built in the United States. So the increase of capacity is not anytime soon. Sadly, this, is, this gives me no pleasure to to reprimand the council, but it just seems that it's become the norm. Councilmember Lau said, we're learning as we go along. The Second Amendment is nothing to be joked about, as Councilmember Cash went down that road. This is talking about people's lives from a financial standpoint and from a potential for being shot and killed. This isn't something that you can just figure out as you go along. This is something that needs to be looked at and, and handled more properly. Um, we went to district voting because we were so worried about a lawsuit and previous city attorney confirmed with me that there was no letter of demand for the lawsuit, but the city decided to go that route anyway. Yet you are so quick to pass this 2A fee structure and most certainly bring on a lawsuit. I don't understand the mentality behind this. 
your actions don't go with what you say. And it's very disturbing to the residents. I think transparency is the only thing that's going to really provide trust in the residents for the, the votes that we gave to you as our elected officials and representing us. Because at the end of the day, if we can't trust you, then what do we have? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bojan. Mm -hmm. Anyone else like to speak? Other comments? Ms. Galvedon. Just a couple of quick things to follow up. Um, actually, to build on what she just said, there, there was a lot of fear, a lot of fear mongering tonight. Um, the Air Board, the California Water Resources um, Water Board, whom I have to do with all the time, they have a tendency to do that a lot. Be very, very careful with what he's saying. There's a lot of money behind that. And also, in being a seismic engineer, first and foremost, one earthquake is the great equalizer. None of this electric stuff's going to work. So to think that a city, that our cities are our first responders, that we're going to need all of the equipment all the time, and we're going to need gas in order to run them because there's going to be no power for, it could be three months because we don't know, nobody really knows what the actual facts. Edison does not have their act together. If you guys think Edison has their act together, you are solely, solely misinformed. So that is something very, very crucial to think about. On the CCW, very, very sad tonight, that's all I can say, because the, the absolute mistrust and the fear mongering that's going on in this country is staggering. And like I said many times, coming from a family who, who was part of night, of the, uh, a night of glass where they would walk around and they broke all the windows. Um, it's horrible. And that's kind of what you're doing here. You're actually labeling people automatically. And that's, I don't know, it's just terrible. And if you don't know what night of glass is, you should look it up. It happened in Germany. It was step one. Um, also for public comment on the air stuff, um, it better be U U.S. made batteries because as we all know, most of the batteries that are coming to, to the U.S. are made in South Africa. And there are so much slaves and their own, it's all owned by Chinese companies down there. And it's 98% through slave labor. So we better not have any non-U.S. made batteries. And then lastly, Board of Supervisors for LA County just changed their speaking requirements for meetings. It's now six minutes per person. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gallina. Anyone else wishes to come to public comment? Anna <coughs> Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> Ann Anderson, Sloan Drive. Well, this was an interesting meeting. Kind of a waste of time, really. Because now we're ending up with a potential lawsuit. Is that right? Am I, am I right? I mean, we had an attorney in here again. How many lawsuits have we been through since I've been coming here? It's quite a bit. And, you know, Sometimes the insurance companies pay for it, but we still have a cost behind these lawsuits. And then we're talking about, well, we can't do this because we don't have the money. Do we have a money? Do we have the money for a lawsuit? Seriously, do we? Because I'm looking on the risk thing of California cities. We're not doing so good. We're just not doing so good. And I think we should start talking about what are we going to do to get our risk factor lower in the city. I mean, we're not as bad as Claremont, we're not as bad as uh, Pomona, but you know, San Dimas is doing great. We're the same size city, and so is Glendora. So what are we gonna do? The, the lawsuits kill us. I mean, how many lawsuits have we had? Well, quite a bit. So I think it was just kind of a waste of time. We ended up where we were last time, and we, we got a little bit of the money down, but um, I don't know meeting for basically nothing. And I do have a question for city manager, if you if you let him answer me. These uh, proclamations that we're having, we're sure having a lot of them. And uh, you know, sometimes they're just on the calendar as a proclamation for the whole United States, and we're going through. You know, the one tonight was bad because we had somebody talking, and we asked, you know, we offered something to them. But some of these proclamations are just. I don't know. I looked online and I noticed that cities around us have a system to get a proclamation to the city council. I just wanted to know from the city manager, do we have a system? Who, who presents these things? Who's the author of them? 
and why do we have them? And like I said, some are okay. We, we pre presented something to one of our citizens, that's great. But sometimes they're just redundant, a lot of these things, because they're already on the cal calendar. We already know what you know, January is. It's just like last October was Italian, uh, American Italian Month. I didn't come up here and say I want a proclamation. It's just, you know, it's just it is redundant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I like to know who's presenting these proclamations, who's the author behind them, and if there is a uh, procedure, because a lot of cities, it almost takes a month to get them on, in, on the calendar. And it seems like, I don't know who's putting, the, who's putting them on or why we're putting them on. And are they, some are good and some are just redundant. Because we can look on the calendar and know, <coughs> what, know what month it is. Okay. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Henry. <laughs> Anyone else for public comment? One more. Yeah. <laughs> I should have gotten up during that five minute break because I'm a little stiff. <laughs> it's been sitting a long time. Um, I'm going to kind of piggyback a little bit on what Anna said because um, it is, some of the proclamations are very, like, you know, predictable. And I'd like to get out of the box um, in a couple different ways. There's, there's so many different things that don't ever get mentioned. Yesterday was World Autism Awareness Day. That's impacting our city a lot. We don't even really know. Births are now like one in 36. So statistically, there's a lot in our, in our city that are affected by that. My own daughter is uh, a young adult with autism, so she's been around uh, a number of decades now. Um, there's, in my history with my family, my parents were foster parents for 40 years. The Los Angeles Board of Supervisors had a whole proclamation process. I don't even know really much about it, but they were um, given a proclamation as the model foster family for the city of Los Angeles way back when I was like junior high. And uh, so that was a big deal. There's got to be situations in our city where, and let's not think outside of the box. Let's look for those situations that are not just, a, okay, it's January, okay, it's February, okay, it's, I mean, we even have National Puppy Day. <laughs> um, I just kind of like to see if, you know, if there is a process for it and, and how we can get something that's a little bit more inspirational, maybe, uh, maybe a little bit more like where do we set the mark in what our community um, includes to go really in a in a broader direction or or maybe a yeah just a a better one a brighter one mm -hmm. so that's that's my suggestion. Thank you, Ms. Berry. Anyone else wish to speak? We have Thomas Allison on the line. Uh, uh, good evening, again. Uh-oh. Are, are we good? All right. Um, I, just, I wanted to actually recognize the leadership of council tonight. Tonight was not a easy decision, um, but I think you guys handled the democratic process with grace. No matter what side of the issue you were on or whatever decision you made, um, having gone through the process and hearing people out and then expressing your opinions, I think, is exactly why the First Amendment matters, and it's why Laverne is a special place to be. So it was not a waste of time. It was, in fact, an act of democracy, and that's what the city council is there to do. So thank you for that. I also want to thank the staff for balancing a very controversial issue and, again, doing so with grace. I think uh, taking time to appreciate them and uh, thanking them for the hard work they do is important because whether we believe it or not, it is the extraordinary miracles that staff pull off year-round that make this city 
what people, why people want to be here. And so it is the staff and the time that we take to appreciate them to keep their morale up that I think uh, makes this all work and makes this city uh, a place that everybody wants to live. So um, I want to leave on a positive note that this was a great act of community. This was an act of democracy. People were compassionate um, and we engaged the way that a community should. So thank you. Anyone else wish to speak on public comment? We're going to close public comment. Today, as council members, Council Member Crosby, Mayor Pro Tem Crosby. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I do want to propose a proclamation that for the next. <laughs> I am on the library. Uh, uh, I'm a library commissioner for the county, and uh, it is Library Month. I want to honor our public library that we have here in Laverne. Um, and want to bring that back uh, next time, which uh, the, the city manager said he would. So it's on the tentative for uh, the 17th. <laughs> um, I also though want to uh, uh, bring um, cash. You you mentioned last time um, two students um, brothers. Yeah. Uh, from Damien for winning the national debate. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that we bring them back soon to honor them as well. Um, thank you, Cash, for that. I then saw it in the paper right afterwards. Um, April is Autism Month, and um, I do have someone dear in my heart, my daughter, uh, Michaela. And um, there's a great sports program. It's called Autism Spectrum Athletics. Uh, they, they take kids from everywhere around and they do great things from um, ages uh, 5 to 18 uh, years old and uh, they're in baseball season right now. Uh, yesterday was their first uh, practice game. Um, they, hold, they hold their games in, um, I believe it's uh, Covina. It's, it's right by Charter Oak High School is where they hold their games. Um, great, great program. And then uh, my last is Mr. Domer. We've heard a lot about um, our community and, and watering around us from um, uh, the LA uh, watering. Um, what is our water consumption and what do we have restrictions anymore or anything like that? We we'll finally want that to be said and told for people. Yes, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, no, on the water issue, so the state, the Metropolitan Water District, and um, Tri-Valleys have all kind of rescinded some of the programs and their mandates for um, mandatory you know, reductions. Uh, but everybody, including the city, is still encouraging uh, conservation because that's how we kind of get through. This is an anomaly year with all the water that has been drenching us, uh, 22 inches plus and all that stuff. Uh, so. The city is no longer uh, imposing any type of penalty surcharge that was allowed. Um, but we, and so therefore you can water more than one day a week. But what we ask is that, uh, and this is in the newsletter, I believe, uh, that you, uh, you know, before a rain event, uh, turn off your automatic sprinklers, wait several days after a rain event. Um, I haven't had my sprinklers on in, since December or so. Mm -hmm. uh, and the grass is looking okay. But, um, so yeah, conservation is still key, but uh, we are no longer doing the penalty surcharges, and everybody else has also stopped the penalties for, uh, and the restrictions on watering one day a week. So you can water more than one day a week. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, thank everybody um, for, again, tonight's discussion. I think it was a very balanced, and um, I think uh, there was no negativity from each other on either side if you were. So I really do appreciate the decorum of our residents on such a um, hot topic. And I uh, hope everyone has a happy Easter and see you at the uh, cool cruise on Saturday. Councilor Lau. So, um, starting off, I just want to say thank you. I know most of the people have left already, but um, it's a long meeting. I know you don't have to be here, but I appreciate that you are. I appreciate that you've written in, that you've called. Um, I think that's what makes um, the community work, is that when we hear from you, and you know, as I stated before, I think all we can commit to and what we should be committing to is that we continue to improve and grow. So I appreciate the feedback and the comments and the way in which everyone conducted themselves tonight. Um, 
with that, I, I wanted to share um, a little bit of a sort of personal um, anecdote. Um, I went. I grew up in West Covina. Um, my sister teaches in West Covina. Um, good friends of mine teach in West Covina um, at my alma mater. Okay. And uh, we had two suicides at West Covina High School last week. Um, a young girl committed suicide first, and then um, her boyfriend then committed suicide um, later. Um, and by all accounts, if you were to have met the young woman, you know, two of my friends had um, both students as, as their students um, involved, participated in multiple sports, good grades, you know, none of the markers that you would have thought, right, or that would be maybe stereotype um, people as uh, being susceptible to, to doing something like that. Um, and I think it's just a reminder, you know, I, I talk about Tri-City Mental Health a lot, and I talk about the programs and the services that are available. I talk about when the next meetings are, and I encourage people to make use of it. Of that. Um, I think that's a, just um, something that I want to remind people of, that, um, you know, look at your neighbors, look at your friends, look at your families. It's not always the people who look like they might have a problem, or look like they're stressed, or look like they might be the person that would put themselves in that situation. Um, these were two young people with, you know, their whole lives ahead of them and, you know, snuffed out, you know, and so I, I think about, you know, what what could we do as a community to look out for each other better, um, especially in those instances, uh, because my heart breaks for my friends who had to teach them, for the families that lost them, um, for the friends that now have to have that, you know, as a reminder in, in their school years of what happened. Um, so I think just, you know, as I always try to say, you know, be kind to each other. I think you guys have exemplified that tonight during a very uh, emotional topic. And I think that we just continue to do that. We're not always going to agree and we're not always going to see eye to eye. But I think the importance is in having the discussion and looking out for each other. So um, as always, be kind. Have a great weekend. It's supposed to be absolutely beautiful. So enjoy it. Enjoy the time with your family and friends. Thank you, Councilmember Council Member Johnson who should have made food in your two-hour recess <laughs> for <laughs> everyone. Right. <laughs> Sorry, I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to help the kids. Say again, the Easter egg hunt that we had over the weekend was a, a great project. Um, I would like to see that event get, <clears throat> get represented in other districts as well. Uh, we've got plenty of parks around the community and I don't want to leave out any section um, or any district um, from fun events like that. Um, so as we improve our parks um, with stages or electricity, um, I'd like to see that happen in other locations as well. Um, Mr. Governor, regarding the water fees, um, we're, not, we're not charging the penalties anymore but those are still on the books, if I recall correctly, because we haven't rescinded anything here on the days. Correct, yeah. We will be bringing back a new ordinance in the future that uh, is a bit... So I guess we had to amend under emergency ordinance or current ordinance because it didn't allow the ability to shift into different gears based on what our suppliers and the state said. So we're going to look at some other model ordinances to bring back. So the next time if there's you know, a state directive or NWD directive, um, you know, we can bring a resolution to do it versus going through an emergency ordinance or other basis. So, um, but it does allow us to stop the penalty surcharges without bringing an emergency ordinance to do it quickly. Great. Appreciate that. Um, that's all I have. Uh, we still have closed session, though, tonight, though. Yes, we do. Didn't go away yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's not my paper anymore. Oh, wait. <laughs> Council member Cat. Did you close session? <laughs> No, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for being an opportunity here. <clears throat> I'm sorry for your loss, Councilor from the Wow. It is a tragic thing, and um, you know, I pray for that family. It's a horrible thing to lose a young one. You raise your children to do just do good, and you know, it's losing that way. And uh, no, no parent should ever have to bear their child. Uh, this is a great city. We'll fight to keep it strong. And it's okay to come here and have discussions to agree to disagree. Please just don't forget, there's still tomorrow, okay? 
there's still tomorrow. So let's see what we can do tomorrow, how we can do better and do good. Uh, one of the things that I was really proud of is my alma mater, Bonita High School, when I went down there and saw the car show, I saw they had built uh, our 99.9% almost done with that electric vehicle. And I told them, and I was really proud to take some great photos with them, and uh, they got one little issue to deal with uh, regarding some charging the vehicle, battery pack, something I don't know. And stopping. I, I don't know about stopping. <laughs> I was like, hey, you know, just bail out the thing. Uh, but it was really cool to see. It was really cool to see. So, they, yeah, you know, they pull little handle things. <laughs> take out half the curve, but that's cool. It was fun to see them. It was good to see these great minds here locally to be able to build such an amazing thing. So I'm hopeful to bring them here to uh, and recognize them here. I'm all about recognition, something I'm very proud of in the military that we do. We recognize, we award, and we do what we can to tell people thank, thank you. you. And, and we appreciate you. And, and your good deeds don't go unwarranted, all right? So that's what I'm all about, and I look forward to that. So. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much for your time here. Uh, you want to mention the hockey? Yes, thank you. Uh, ice, hockey. ice hockey. Yes. I'm, okay, thank you. Uh, so, Dane High School did win the state championships. So I did reach out to them. They went to the nationals, unfortunately, came really close. And hopefully, next year, uh, they get out there and, um, and win it all. But they did win the state championships here. We also reached out to them. And we'll hopefully get them out of here as well to recognize them. And furthermore, I did reach out to Pastor Lincoln from Baptist High School, uh, Baptist School in K 12, and also in Lutheran to let them know please, if you have any accomplishments that our amazing uh, kids here in Laverne have done, reach out to me immediately. I want to recognize them and let them know. So, for everybody here in Laverne. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Cash. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to just pardon everyone. I'm very sorry for your friends. Uh, that's a horrific situation, as Councilman Cash said. You never want to bury your children. So I, I can't even imagine that. So um, I do want to say that uh, the excellent adventure that was at uh, Heritage Park this weekend, we did four shifts, different age groups. Absolute success. Uh, Community Services Director Von Duran, we had the police department. Thank you, uh, Acting uh, Chief Gonzalez, for your staff. They were giving out candy. I want to thank Public Works. They were there also. It was it, Amazingly done, uh, and also Lauren Rotary was there. They donated for the uh, for the uh, eggs, and also uh, put the eggs out in each different uh, shift for the different kids. Fun was successful. Blues were great. Heritage Foundation did a great job. Historical Society, you heard. So um, we just continue to do wonderful things in our community with the Community Service Department. Thank you to our uh, City Manager Ken Domer also for making that happen with his staff. They did an excellent job. Uh, we do have a lot of things coming up. That car cruise this weekend. Um, we've got, um, remember, don't forget the sidewalk coloring contest for the Monero Square. I know they're all adults here. If you want to do it, it's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> Color all you want. Um, and then, um, really, uh, a happy Easter to all those people. Please have a wonderful time on Sunday. It's going to be a gorgeous weekend. Enjoy your family. Uh, and let's all remember, as Council Member uh, Lau stated, mental illness is very serious. There are avenues to get help. Tri-City is one of them, but there are multiple areas with phone numbers to call if there's an issue. And I know that, uh, look for the signs, keep a close eye out, because it's serious, and especially with the pandemic, it's created even more of an issue, so we must all keep our eyes on that. Um, we have a closed session tonight, Mr. Gilmore, is that correct? Yes, we do. We will, uh, we will. Sure, yeah. Uh, City Council meeting closed session for serving the government code section. 54957.6 for the following conference with labor negotiators. The negotiators are the city manager, assistant city manager, and assistant city attorney. The employee organizations are the Laverne City Employees Association, Laverne Police Officers Association, Laverne Police Middle Management Association, Laverne Firefighters Association, and all unrepresented employees. There's a second item the city council meeting closed session with legal counsel to determine whether or not to participate in the national opioid settlements with manufacturers and distributors pursuant to government code section 54956.9. Will we be reporting out, Council? Huh? Uh, yes, I expect to report out on that item. Okay. Before we uh, recess into closed session, um, we're going to be adjourning in memory of Army Specialist D4 veteran Michael Montalvo, who died on March 5th, 2023. Michael was drafted in the Army in 1966 and served two years fighting in the Vietnam War. He, along with longtime friend David Alvarado, Mr. Alvarado's here in the audience, right here. Um, uh, they started the Band of Brothers Post 12034 in 2008, and thank you for that, Mr. Alvarado. Mm -hmm. 
After his military service, he was a truck driver for many years. Later, he became a barber and worked in Claremont. People who knew him described him as modest, humble, and a friend to the veterans. He is survived by his wife, Annette Montalvo, two daughters, two sons, seven grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. Mm -hmm. Now, we have his daughter here, is that correct? Yes. And the two grandchildren? And they served in what military capacity? Both of you? Army. Army? Army. Army. Thank you for serving very much. Thank you. And uh, and thank you for what your father did and your grandfather did, along with uh, Mr. Alvarado. It's a wonderful thing we have, our band of brothers, and we're very proud of them. So thank you very much. I'd like to get a picture of you guys with the council before you go, so we'll be done in just a second. The next regular scheduled meeting of the Laverne City Council is scheduled from uh, Monday, April 17th at 6.30 p.m. I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Thank you for your comments. And this mm -hmm. meeting is adjourned at 11 p.m. Recess. Oh, what? Recess. 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 Excuse me. Recess at 11 p.m. <laughs> Yeah, it's spelled W-I-A. Yeah, it's spelled W-I-A.